We are ready to go. I'm guessing the screen will change. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Montgomery County State Delegation. I'm Delegate Julie Polakovich Carr, and I have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the Montgomery County House Delegation. And to my right is Senator Ben Kramer, who chairs our Senate delegation. We're very pleased this evening to be joined by the senior leadership team of the Maryland Department of Transportation, including Secretary Wiedefeld uh, and other administrators within the department. Mm -hmm. um, tonight, we will be briefed on the draft Maryland Consolidated Transportation Program. This is an opportunity for members of our delegation and for our municipal and county uh, elected officials to ask some questions and, and raise some issues of interest to the, to the county. Uh, this evening, we are very appreciative to have this annual opportunity to check in with you all and to have a discussion about transportation infrastructure and capital projects in our jurisdiction. Um, before I turn things over to Senator Kramer for some opening remarks, I just wanted to share on behalf of the entire delegation our condolences on the passing of the MDTA executive director to his family, to the entire MDOT team, uh, and, and wanted to share those condolences. Uh, Senator Kramer, do you have any opening remarks? Good evening. Uh, thanks to all those who are here this evening, both from the public, live streaming, uh, as well as delegation members. And uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here with all the, the top tier uh, in, uh, that are part of your team. Um, I always have to take a moment just because uh, to say thank you to Administrator Neiser. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, she's amazing. And uh, there is a not a week that goes by that I don't have a constituent that has some issue with the Motor Vehicle Administration. And um, she immediately and personally responds to every one of those constituents. She reaches out personally to uh, my constituents. And I have to say uh, I am most appreciative for that. And, uh, and thank you all for the service that you are doing for the residents of the state of Maryland. So on behalf of the entire uh, Montgomery County Senate delegation, uh, thank you for being here this evening. And uh, I too share uh, the sentiment that was express, expressed by Chair Polakovich Carr, uh, our condolences on the, uh, the loss to the team. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it back to P Delegate Polakovich Carr. And actually, we'll turn it over to you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much. Um, before, before we start, I did want to thank the Montgomery County Executive and their team, um, <clears throat> and the, obviously the council and the delegation for your kindness and understanding to reschedule the CTP meeting. Uh, Joey Sagal, the Executive Director of the Maryland Transportation Authority, passed away on the day we were initially scheduled to have the meeting. Um, Governor Westmore and many of us attended Joey's funeral this past Monday. Joey started um, as executive director in August, but he had already served MDOT in the Federal Highway Administration for 25 years. 
Um, he was an integral team member at both MDTA, the Toll Authority, and the State Highway Administration. Joey served as the MDTA, MDTA's Chief Operating Officer and held leader, leadership positions at State Highway, including Deputy Administrator, Chief Engineer for Operations, and leading State Highway's Handover Complex. He also served as several, uh, on several volunteer fire departments in Baltimore and Car Carroll County, and he had a national legacy in the ITS uh, arena as well. Um, <clears throat> he will be missed dearly uh, in our thoughts and, fears, um, thoughts and prayers got to his family, obviously. So thank you. Um, with me tonight is um, the, the entire team. As, as you mentioned, Holly Arnold, the administrator of the Maryland Transit Administration, Drew, <clears throat> Drew Morrison from the Washington Area Transit Office, State Highway Administrator Will Pines, and um, Transportation Authority, Melissa Williams, who heads up the Plan and Program Development, and then also uh, Chrissy Neiser, who you mentioned, which is, um, she is one of the best, if not the best in the country, uh, but I also feel very proud of everyone else at this table. Uh, I think they're equally as strong. Um, and then uh, Ricky, uh, Ricky Smith from the Maryland Avi Aviation Administration is here. I did want to do one quick follow-up on MAKO. We did meet MAKO during the summer. Uh, the conference, you know, it's a great opportunity for us to meet and get uh, early warning of some of, this, of some of the issues from the, from the county. Regarding uh, transportation directors, Chris Conklin's request to develop a streamlined permitting and review process for the county's bus rapid transit project within state highways right away. We're evaluating how we can focus resources to support the county's priorities, so we are working with him on that. We also celebrate uh, Montgomery County DOT's $2 million regional accelerator grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation, and the grant will focus on streamlining BRT delivery, and we'll be an active partner in that effort as well. So those are issues that were brought up during MACO. Uh, the Department of Transportation is committed to working in partnership and transparency with the communities we're here to serve. We will deliver the service and facilities support governor's goals of social equity, environmental protection, and sustainable communities. Most importantly, MDOT will build and maintain a transportation network that provides not just physical mobility, but economic mobility to lift all Marylanders in all communities. <clears throat> we made some progress, uh, but we have a long way to go, for sure. In terms of an operation perspective from the department, we have three major priorities. One is obviously the safety. Safety of our employees, safety of our contractors, safety of every customer that uses any of our facilities or services. To that end, we are committed to Vision Zero. I have directed the department take a thorough review of our regulations, our policies, our designs to make sure we're doing everything that we can to keep people safe on the system. I've also directed the staff to take a, a hard look at the complete streets policy, which hasn't been updated in 11 years, um, particularly to, to focus on the most vulnerable users of this. Unfortunately, last year with the fatalities we had in the state, almost a third of those uh, were the most vulnerable, bicyclists and pedestrians. So we have to make sure we're doing everything we can to do, to do a better job. Our second priority is to preserve the system, the multi-billion dollar investment that the citizens of Maryland made in all the modes that are represented here today, and to make sure that we don't uh, let fall behind on some of those. Um, having served at Metro for a number of years, uh, you know, we, we all experience what happens when you do that. Right? You, you have to fix it, and it's going to cost you more later, and you suffer through that pain. So we have to make sure we continue to do that. And then finally, <clears throat> we look at enhancing the system to support economic development and improve plan in planned growth areas uh, throughout the state uh, as dollars become available. But we want to do that in a multimodal fashion wherever we can. So that will be our focus on enhancements. <clears throat> we also have a new priority uh, that I think is coming to focus for all of us, and that's dealing with climate change is how do we build a system that's resilient to all the pressures that we're under with climate, uh, particularly with a state like ours, with um, the, you know, the, the, the coastlines and the different parts that we have throughout the state. So that is another large focus area for us. So obviously creating this system and maintaining it and building upon it, and at the same time being competitive both regionally, nationally, and internationally takes quite a bit of investment. And, and frankly, we, we, I believe we need to invest at a higher level to do some of the things that we all want to do for our, custom, for our customers uh, and for our communities. <clears throat> As you know, the key funding source for, the transporta for transportation in the state from a DOT perspective is the trust fund, and it's under quite a bit of tr uh, stress. Similar to what the county's gone through, obviously with, with record inflation, with material issues, with labor issues that have all driven our costs up. Um, so that's one big pressure that I think we all share. 
We had a unique opportunity and advantage with the COVID dollars we got from the federal government, particularly to support the transit in the Washington region, the Baltimore region. Those dollars are drying up, and they were close to $3 billion. And so those dollars are no longer there, so we got to, to deal with that as well. Um, <clears throat> we're also, we have our major funding source is the uh, motor fuel tax, which is over 20% of our fuels, uh, our taxes in the uh, revenues in the trust fund. And as you can imagine, as cars come um, much more um, miles per gallon, do better. That's fantastic for customers, but, but from a financial model, that puts a lot of stress on us. And as we, electrif as we electrify the fleet, same issue. Um, so that is a pressure point that we have. Uh, titling tax, our other major source of revenue, is also under similar pressure. Cars are being built to last longer, which is fantastic for, for consumers. But from a financial model perspective, it does put pressure on us to do that. We've been fortunate to, to be able to pull down a lot of federal dollars with the IAG mon IHA money, and we'll continue to do that. That has two major sort of sources for us. One is the formula dollars that we get in, in the programs that we are, are part of. Those generally are an 80-20, 80 federal 20 split. So we continue to match that. But the other part, the other part uh, opportunity for us is discretionary dollars, where you're competing across the nation to do those. And those generally run about 50-50, 50 state, 50 local, uh, 50 federal. So you got to compete. So you got to have the dollars to have that to do that. So that's another stress uh, on the trust fund. All this has, 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 has sort of played out in the development of the draft CTP that we're presenting today. It's a $21 billion program over six years, of which we have almost a $2 billion hole in that program because of some of these pressures I just mentioned. And that is just to deliver what we've already been talking about, not the things that we want to, where we want to go right, with the state. So that is a huge challenge for us to, 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 real, to deal with that. Um, the reality is we could have cut the projects and presented a program with those cuts. Uh, we did take a different approach because I think this is a much broader discussion. A, I want to hear from all the counties that I've been meeting with to understand their priorities, but then to have a broader discussion of how we're going to deal with this issue. Um, so that's why we presented a program that did not do that uh, at this time. Again, we're at that stage where we want to hear from all of our um, stakeholders. Fortunately, the legislature has uh, taken initiative to start to wrestle with these issues. They passed a bill last year that set up a revenue and infrastructure needs uh, commission of roughly 30 individuals, of uh, professionals and stakeholders and environmental groups and, and a number of users of the system to work through some of these issues. A draft report is due to the governor uh, on January of 24 with a final due uh, next year. So they are still working through some of those issues. They're starting to, to uh, sort of focus on some of the priorities they're going to, or some of the recommendations they're going to make shortly. So that's sort of a large picture of what's going on with the department. Um, if I may, I'd like to have each administration just go through at a high level again where they are and then uh, project specific to Montgomery County interests. So I'll start with Holly Arnold with the Maryland Aviation, or Maryland Transit Administration. No, no, thank you on the aviation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's not that good. <laughs> uh, so good evening. Uh, my name is Holly Arnold. I'm the administrator of the Maryland Transit Administration. Um, I'm joined here by Bray Biggs, our senior project director for the Purple Line. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what MTA is doing to support frequent, reliable, and easy to use transit throughout Maryland. Public transit is essential to ensuring economic and social mobility, addressing the climate crisis, and needed reductions in carbon emissions, as well as reducing congestion and promoting safer and healthier streets for our entire region. Maryland's investments in new transit infrastructure and maintaining our systems in a state of good repair will make a difference in people's lives throughout the state. Uh, just highlighting a few of the exciting projects underway at MTA. Uh, obviously, the Purple Line uh, construction is nearly 60% complete, with underground utility relocations at 98% complete. Across the alignment, there are more than 60 active construction sites and approximately 1,100 workers. Work continues to advance at the Bethesda shaft, where we are excavating to connect to the WMATA Metro Red Line. The Purple Line light rail vehicles are expected to be delivered to the Glen Ridge Maintenance Facility in early 2024. And the Purple Line uh, team just finished the Fall Community Advisory Team, or the CAP meetings, which they began early October. On the commuter rail side, we're focused on Mark service expansion, which includes closing the Mark septa gap and adding run-through service to Virginia. Just this week, Amtrak, with MTA's uh, partnership, was awarded $7 billion in funds uh, to support increased service on the Northeast Corridor here in Maryland. 
And earlier this year, MTA published the Brunswick Study Technical Report and recently published the results of that online survey. We're also currently updating the MARC Growth and Transformation Plan, which will be taking place over the next year and will outline major investments and a vision for commuter rail throughout the state. We released a survey earlier this month. I encourage everyone to share their thoughts and share with your constituents, and the survey will remain open through December 4th. MTA also continues to support all of our locally operated transit systems who are critical partners in providing transit throughout the state. And we make a significant investment in transit in Montgomery County by providing more than $36 million in operating and capital grants to support local transit operations. Recently, we've also undertaken a comprehensive review of the LOTS operating funding allocation formula, and I'm pleased to report that beginning next July, funding will be adjusted so that allocation distributions are more equitable and responsive to changes in local jurisdictions' investment in transit service. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak on the important work currently underway at MTA, and I would now like to turn it over to Drew Morrison at the Washington Area Transit Office. Thank you, Holly. I'm Drew Morrison, Acting Director of the Washington Area Transit Office, which oversees the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, for MDOT. Hundreds of thousands of Marylanders rely on WMATA services every day, which is why Secretary Wiedefeld includes Metro as one of MDOT's modes. The transit agency is an integral part of Maryland's transportation system. Along with Virginia, D.C., and the federal government, MDOT plays a major role in funding WMATA's modes, including Metro Rail, Metro Bus, and Metro Access. The majority of Maryland's funding to WMATA comes from the Transportation Trust Fund, and each year the state pays about $1 billion. That breaks down into about $473 million for operating and $509 million for capital projects. And over the next six years, programmed into this draft CTP is more than $2.1 billion for WMATA's capital program. $167 million each year comes from dedicated funding from the state's general fund, uh, and that dedicated funding goes towards helping to rebuild WMATA's system and bring it to a state of good repair. Uh, in challenging news, WMATA is facing a $750 million fiscal cliff starting in fiscal year 2025. It has laid out different options to its board of directors, and MDOT is currently coordinating with WMATA and our regional partners to better understand our options to address this critical issue. Uh, and we will be using the information WMATA has provided to the board to continue to engage stakeholders on the path forward. I um, want to highlight two initiatives we're excited about in terms of the future of WMATA. Uh, MDOT supports WMATA in transit-oriented development at metro stations in Maryland. Uh, programmed into this draft CTP is $1 million every year in continued commitment to joint development efforts. Uh, under this administration, with the Department's Chief of Transit-Oriented Development, we are actively working with WMATA to provide direction on where and how to spend funds that MDOT previously contributed for TOD. Uh, and so that means happening this fiscal year alone, we're funding TOD projects at North Bethesda, Shady Grove, Silver Spring, Twinbrook, and Wheaton Metro stations here in Montgomery County. And taken together, these projects support the Moore Miller administration's goal of making transit a catalyst to lift neighborhoods, boost the economy, create jobs, and connect residents with opportunity. Also want to highlight the Better Bus Network effort. This is a re-envisioning of the future of bus service in the D.C. metro region, uh, working with our partners at Ride On through their Ride On Reimagined efforts. We're looking forward to seeing how the bus, whether it's Metro and Ride On, uh, the workhorse of the transit system can evolve over time to advance access to opportunity in an equitable way. Uh, so thank you for the time to outline MDOT's commitments to WMATA and a few of the projects we're excited about here in Maryland. And I'll turn it over to State Highway Administrator Will Pines. All right. Well, thank you, Drew, and good evening, everyone. I'm Will Pines, and I'm excited to be here with you this year, this time leading the State Highway Administration. I'm just a few months in, but I'm really excited about SHA's future. Under my leadership, SHA will continue to advance infrastructure projects that will connect Marylanders to jobs and economic opportunities. Building and maintaining a multimodal transportation system for all users that is safe, equitable, and balanced, that's our goal. That means we're going to reimagine how our highway network supports the needs of our communities. We'll be putting a greater focus on safety statewide because we believe that one lost life is one too many. So we're going to be focusing in and honing in on asset safety, work zone, and vulnerable user safety. This spring, SHA released Maryland's first pedestrian safety action plan, or what we refer to as the PSAT plan. And this is a new data-driven tool to enhance pedestrian and bicycle safety for communities across the state. 
We are making significant investments to deliver PSAT projects, working with our new active transportation team within SHA and also our local district office. We're also taking a fresh look at organizational efficiency. I've asked the SHA team to focus on project delivery, permit approvals, and procurement timelines to look at opportunities to streamline the processes while maintaining ethics and doing good business. This will focus both on delivering SHA projects faster and conducting timely reviews and support for county and developer projects and permits. We realize there are challenges ahead, but this doesn't mean that we're going to change our goals. We will continue to improve safety, accessibility, mobility, and a state of good repair. We have to be poised to leverage every available federal dollar to accomplish as much as we can, and this includes pursuing multiple federal grant opportunities. We'll also continue to work to deliver local projects because we believe that partnership with local governments and the communities is the key to our mutual successes. I'd now like to highlight a few of SHA's projects and accomplishments over this past year. Over the past year, SHA has completed a number of pedestrian bicycle Vision Zero safety projects in the county. Out of 366 context-driven improvements statewide, we've completed 168 improvements here in Montgomery County. Improvements range from ADA-compliant ramps, signals that prioritize pedestrian crossings, otherwise known as leading pedestrian intervals, or LPIs for short, no turn on red regulatory improvements, transit signal priority, red light cameras, and new traffic signals. In the past 12 months, SHA has implemented over 30 new leading pedestrian intervals at signalized intersections throughout Montgomery County. We've also upgraded numerous crosswalks to high visibility standards across the county and continue to do so programmatically. In the coming weeks, SHA will complete construction on a new signal at MD-124 at Pier Point Place in the city of Gaithersburg. This new signal includes a high visibility pedestrian crosswalk, APS, CPS, and ADA compliant ramps. These multimodal improvements provide safe access to and from transit facilities on both sides of Maryland 124. SHA recently opened segments on the two-mile Maryland 97 Brookville bypass to traffic. We anticipate the bypass will be fully complete at the end of the year. The collaborative efforts with the county reflect SHA's approach to safety that goes beyond traffic alleviation, prioritizing the well-being of all road users and residents in the historic town. SHA is working to improve the commutes for motorists traveling along the I-270 corridor with the innovative congestion management project. The metered southbound ramps and other improvements along southbound I-270 were completed in 2021. This project provides time savings for motorists traveling along mainline I-270 and Maryland 80 to I-495. I'm proud to announce that the National Operations Center for Excellence awarded this project, the I-270 ICPM project, as the best HISMO project of 2023. This national organization recognizes the TISMO best practices throughout the country and works to advance TISMO and innovative transportation solutions. In August, Governor Moore announced the submission of a formal federal grant application to address mobility and access challenges along the American Legion Bridge I-495-270 corridor. We are focusing on engagement, responsiveness, and multimodal solutions to address mobility and access as part of Governor Moore's vision and are committed to working with our partners throughout the region. We announced the public engagement opportunities that are coming up through our open house meetings. These are going to be scheduled for November 13th, 15th, and 16th, and also in December on Saturday, December 2nd. And last month, Governor Moore announced more than $25 million in federal and state grants for 40 bicycle, pedestrian, and trail projects across Maryland. Through the Recreational Trails Program, $45,000 was awarded to the Northwest Branch Boardwalk Project. Through the Trans Transportation Alternatives Program, $224,000 for the Fleet and Monroe Complete Streets, $679,000 for the Forest Glen Road Sidewalk, and $400,000 to complete the design of a 10-foot wide ADA bike link from Indus Industrial Drive to West Deer Park Road. Through the M.Kim Lampier Bikeways Network, 
88,000 was awarded to the city of Rockville for a feasibility study and preliminary design for a bicycle facility from Halpine Road and East Jefferson Street. 465,000 was awarded to the Metropolitan Branch Trail for final design and 176,000 was awarded to Gaithersburg for final design of the I-270 National Institute and Standards and Technology Shared Use Path. Finally, I want to take a moment to thank our district engineer, Derek Gunn, who has joined me today and uh, he often, he and his team offer support to the local community and for constituent services. We're also joined by Andre, our, our chief operating officer, and Joe Mogus, our safety uh, policy director here, uh, who's joined us this evening. And I'm very grateful for the support that they provide to all of you. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and I'll now turn it over to my colleague at the MDTA, Melissa. Thanks, Will. Good evening. I'm Melissa Williams. I'm the Director of Planning and Program Development at the Maryland Transportation Authority. Financed by toll revenue, the MDTA is the independent state agency that finances, owns, operates, preserves, and secures Maryland's eight toll facilities. And we're investing those toll dollars right back into our world-class infrastructure for all Marylanders. The MDTA's commitment to maintaining Maryland's toll roads and bridges is paramount as well as doing our part to watch over the thousands of people traveling those roads every day. Now I'd like to talk about a few projects that keep Montgomery County residents connected every day. To begin, the ICC. In 2023, MDTA police officers assigned to the Intercounty Connector Detachment have removed impaired drivers and wanted fugitives from Maryland roadway, motorways. Officers have arrested more than 75 drivers who were either impaired by alcohol and or drugs or wanted for other offenses. The MDTA police continue to strengthen relationships with law enforcement partners in Montgomery County. Throughout 2023, MDTA police officers have participated in joint traffic and safety and community outreach efforts with the Montgomery County Police Department, the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, the Maryland National Capital Park Police, and other law enforcement agencies in Montgomery County. From the ICC to the Bay Bridge, our roads keep Marylanders connected. For many Marylanders, visiting the Eastern Shore plays a big part in their leisure activities. The 2028, I'm sorry, the $28 million Chesapeake Bay Crossing Study Tier 2 NEPA is analyzing alternatives for providing adequate capacity and access to improve travel reliability, mobility, and safety across the Bay Bridge and along the US 50 301 corridor. We held numerous public engagement activities through the summer of 2023 and heard that Marylanders are frustrated with congestion at the Bay Bridge and want relief from traffic jams that occur year round. Details about the study and additional opportunities to provide input are online at baycrossingstudy.com. When you think of the Maryland Transportation Authority, you may think that our responsibility ends once the bridge is crossed or the light at the end of the tunnel becomes visible. Our customers' toll dollars support so much more. The Maryland Transportation Authority keeps our customers connected to life's opportunities. We will continue to be an agency dedicated to innovative transportation solutions that promote equity and support economic development. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening, and I would now like to turn it over to Chrissy Neiser at MVA. Thank you, Melissa, and it's a pleasure to be with you again this evening. At MBA, we've always been focused on customer service, but due to some process changes, as well as a major IT modernization effort, we've really enabled to step up our customer service delivery. Gone are those days where you make a joke about bringing a book or maybe your lunch to the MBA. In fact, um, at the branches here in Montgomery County, our wait time last year was between six and eight minutes. So really dedicated to that premier customer service experience. But we're also looking at how can we um, expand that and make it even better for customers. One thing we've done is create a one-stop shop environment, meaning you can do other government services right at our MBA branch offices. Gaithersburg is a perfect example of that. Um, you can complete a TSA pre-check process. Um, uh, if you need to go to the port, you can get a TWIC card for our port workers. Um, you can get a Maryland birth certificate printed if you need that for your driver's license or ID card. Um, we also have an Easy Pass um, customer service center to help customers there, and a veterans benefit office that has assisted more than 15,000 veterans in the area just since it opened in 2021. So we're really proud of those partnerships and obviously the convenience it provides to 
our residents. We've also recently installed um, an electric vehicle charging station at the Gaithersburg branch office, so another nice service. Our limited branch offices like Kemp Mill and Walnut Hill, with our IT modernization, we can now do a much broader set of services, so that brings and expands services in other communities. We recently announced the expansion of the number of languages that we translate our law tests into, up to 17 different languages, including American Sign Language that was just deployed a few weeks ago, so we're excited about the accessibility that brings. We're also translating all the driver manuals into that, and it's all based on plain language, which is a more um, understandable way of being able to provide the information to our customers, not only for those who may have some developmental disabilities where language challenges are there, but just for all of our customers, we want to make sure that information is convenient and accessible. We do recognize that it's not just our branch offices, that accessibility is important. It's also about online services um, and other ways of completing transactions. So we are glad to say 75% of our customers did complete transactions outside the branch office over the last year. Some new services that we've offered over the last year with the legislation that went in about HOV permits, we've to date issued 4,900 of those to customers. And in terms of electric vehicles, as we talk about that, 1,300 customers have applied for the state's electric vehicle tax credit. The MBA also continues our outreach efforts, and that includes partnering with Pathfinders to hand out um, the blue cards, a developmental disability uh, card to help law enforcement recognize and uh, respond more appropriately if someone is stopped. We're really happy to be able to partner in this way, but as the Secretary said, safety is really a key priority of us, and so we want to make sure that we're doing the right things in that area. Unfortunately, we're seeing the numbers moving in the wrong direction, as he alluded to. Um, here in Montgomery County, we know we lost 48 people last year. So far this year, the number's at 39, um, but we know those aren't just numbers. Those are people and members of the community. Statewide, the numbers, um, unfortunately, are approaching 600. If we project towards the end of the year, we have not been at that number since 2007. Clearly not a place we want to be, um, and so we really have been making a call to action everywhere we are throughout the state. As we do the analysis, the causes are really the same. It's um, speed, it's impairment, it's people not buckling up, that's in all positions, and distraction. Um, you certainly have a great advocate for safety here, and I want to acknowledge uh, Delegate Carr. Um, for her great work in the legislature and really bringing this issue to the forefront. Um, and it is about that partnership. We really appreciate working with Montgomery County and your Vision Zero and, and bringing people together because that's the only way we're going to be able to resolve this. Uh, Governor Moore did announce more than 168,000 in highway safety grants recently, and that goes to law enforcement agencies and organizations right here in Montgomery County. Um, we've also announced recently our crash dashboard, which is updated real time, so that's a great planning tool for local jurisdictions to be able to work together to fight this issue and reach our goal of zero fatalities. We'll continue to try to come up with those innovative solutions. The Secretary has really challenged us to look at things differently and try to figure out how we reduce the number of fatalities we're seeing. In closing, I just always like to take a moment and thank our MBA employees for the great job they do. You know, I talk about all these wonderful things that we've accomplished. It's only because of them that it all happens every day, and they have very difficult jobs. So um, it's really important to recognize their good work. So thank you for your time, and now I'll hand it over to Ricky to talk about MAA. All right, thank you, Chrissy, the amazing Chrissy Meiser. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Maryland Aviation System plays a critical role in supporting travel, tourism, and economic development. Governor Moore has spoken about the great assets we have in the state of Maryland that will ensure a dynamic growing economy for the long term. The important assets include our public use airports across the state that generate jobs and connect residents and businesses to the global economy. One of those important airport assets is, of course, BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport, which serves as a major transportation resource and economic engine for the state with an economic impact of over $9 billion annually. In terms of passenger traffic, BWI Marshall is currently at about 90% of full recovery following the pandemic. Looking ahead to the fourth quarter, airline seat capacity is up 17% from last year, and more significantly, 3% higher than the same period in 2019 prior to the pandemic. We continue to welcome new airline partners and in growing international and domestic air service. We are committed 
to work it every day to make our facilities the most efficient, user-friendly airports for our customers. The Maryland Aviation Administration's capital program continues at historic high levels with a six-year program of over $1 billion. We forecast over $330 million in capital spending for this year with further growth in fiscal year 2025 to reach about $350 million. It's notable that we are successfully lever leveraging federal dollars to support our capital needs. Thanks to our federal delegation, we have over $280 million in anticipated federal funds programmed in the draft CTP. Throughout our capital program, we're advancing important projects that will enhance BWI Marshall for our passengers and provide important facilities for our customers and our partners. These critical improvements will shape BWI Marshall for decades to come. The MA continues to support 34 public use airports that serve communities across the state for the statewide aviation grants program that provides important support thanks to MDOT and Secretary Wiedefeld. MAA intends to administer some $2.8 million in funding during fiscal year 2024 for regional airports across the state. This includes about $182,000 in funding for Montgomery County Air Park to support land acquisition for obstruction removal. With that, I again want to thank you, and I will now hand it back to Secretary Wiedefeld. Thank you, Ricky, and thank the entire team. As you can see, we're very busy. Um, but that concludes our presentation. Be glad to take any questions or comments that, that you may have for the council. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you all. We're actually going to start with uh, representatives from our county government first. So I'll call up uh, Council Vice President Andrew Friedson and representing the county executive. We have Rich Madaleno, the chief administrative officer, and Chris Conklin, who heads the county's Department of Transportation. They can come on up and get started. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, and welcome to Rockville. Uh, it's great uh, to have you here, administrators. Madam Chair and Mr. Chair, uh, great to be here as well. I'm Andrew Friedson, Vice President of the County Council. I'm here representing the County Council. Council President Glass, along with the County Executive, are on an economic development trade mission, and so uh, you uh, are stuck with us uh, to, to, to represent uh, as well. I just want to acknowledge Councilmember Fonda Gonzalez, who's here with us uh, as well. Uh, Councilmember Balcom, I know, has tuned in. I'm sure other council members uh, have uh, as well. Uh, and before I begin, I just want to also express on behalf of the council my condolences to the whole MDOT team, the MDTA team, to Joey's family. Uh, we're so very sorry for your loss and glad that we had an opportunity to uh, acknowledge uh, all of his contributions to our state, uh, to state government uh, at the beginning of this, this, this hearing. So thank you. Uh, I'm uh, also uh, will say I was very heartened uh, to hear the priorities of, uh, of, of, of the secretary and of the department, uh, particularly around road safety and complete streets and transit and multimodal transportation. So thank you for acknowledging that. And I uh, wanted to note that we are very pleased to see the proposed spending level on transportation increasing by 70, uh, $728 uh, $5 million compared to the previous CTP through a combined increase in state and federal resources. Uh, however, MDOT staff has advised us at the county that the Transportation Trust Fund is projected to be short by $100 million in FY25 and by $2.1 billion in the five-year period of FY25 to 29. We're aware of the Commission on Transportation Revenue and Infrastructure Needs, the Train Commission, as was noted earlier by the Secretary, uh, that's been charged with providing an initial report this coming January and a final report in 2025. But we need revenue proposals upon the upon which the General Assembly can act uh, in the upcoming session to avoid major cuts to projects already budgeted in Montgomery County and around the state. So we look forward to uh, hearing what the train commission uh, comes up with and appreciate your leadership on that. Uh, it's also good to see some res restoration of highway user revenues made available to counties and municipalities to meet local needs. As you know, this is an ongoing concern. Uh, we appreciate uh, you continuing uh, to do that and just want to make sure that that is sustained and enhanced in future years. There are uh, years and years of underfunding and we need uh, a lot more commitment uh, in order to make up uh, the significant needs that we have at the local, uh, county, and municipal level. An important concern for the next few years will be addressing the projected operating shortfall at WMATA and encouraging ridership and revenue recovery. An emphasis should be placed on retaining essential bus services that serve communities that rely on transit in Montgomery County. You noted the most vulnerable users 
and the most vulnerable users in Montgomery County ride buses, many of which are WMATA buses. Mm -hmm. And we certainly need significant financial support uh, for that. Rail service predictability and reliability also needs to be achieved so that people feel more comfortable relying on Metro Rail for their travel needs. We need to make sure that it's competitive so that they actually choose uh, Metro Rail so that we can drive up uh, ridership. And few people know that better than you, Mr. Secretary, so we appreciate your ongoing uh, efforts there. Uh, we are disappointed to learn the completion of the Georgia Avenue project in Montgomery Hills will likely be delayed by a year until FY 2031. And we urge the State Highway Administration to do everything it can to put this long awaited project on the schedule to be completed in FY uh, 2030. We appreciate the, the governor, the secretary, and so many others joining with Councilmember Fani Gonzalez and many of us uh, there and, and hope that we can advance uh, that, that, that project sooner. We are also disappointed that the Clapper Road project in Gaithersburg, our highest priority under un, unfunded road project, is still not funded for construction. The Watkins Mill interchange with I-270 has now been open for a few years and traffic patterns on Clapper Road have changed substantially as a result. We need more MDOT engagement and transportation investment to grow our economy and appreciate, Mr. Secretary, you noting that in the beginning, the connection uh, between transportation and economic development opportunities. A focus on the implementation of bus rapid transit, especially including uh, uh, 355, 29, 586, and 650, and a segment of Maryland 187 would significantly help Maryland's economy as well as Montgomery County's economy. These projects are all on state highways and have the potential to transform these corridors and enable significant economic growth and vitality for the entire region. Several of those corridors also enable connections to our neighboring jurisdictions, including Howard County, Prince George's County, the District of Columbia, and Fairfax County, bringing significant benefits to our entire regional economy and our entire regional transportation network. Together, these projects can boost life sciences in North Bethesda, near the FDA in White Oak, and near Shady Grove, while also improving connections between major population and activity centers to better serve some of our most disadvantaged communities. We need to accelerate work to reduce serious and fatal collisions, and MDOT is a serious and essential partner for this work. Again, appreciate your commitment to that and, and raising that in your opening remarks as well. Uh, we need more directed investment in traffic signals, in traffic signal modernization, and protected uh, crossing implementation. We need MDOT to realize and recognize that sidewalks and shared use paths are critical state infrastructure and are just as important as car carrying parts of our roadways. We need clear, identifiable, and financially significant investment to those critical aspects of our transportation infrastructures and the rights of way. Regarding the express toll lanes on 270 in the western segment of the Beltway, we're encouraged about several changes the, the Moore administration has already announced. Starting with improvements to the American Legion Bridge, that addresses the most pressing short-term concern that we have in Montgomery County including the design of Upper 270 into Frederick County, will guarantee that the entire set of improvements on I-270 will be evaluated in a holistic way. We are also pleased that the project will likely be funded in a conventional way with federal and state revenue supplementing the tolls rather than relying predominantly on, private sector, on, on a private sector partner. This will allow for more accountability and transparency during construction and the ultimate operation of the facility. We look forward to working with you uh, on that. Uh, however, our largest outstanding concern is that there is not specific funding commitment in the draft CTP for major uh, transit investment as part of this project. The Hogan administration promised new bus depot at, at Metropolitan Grove, expansion of the bus bay capacity at Shady Grove, expansion of park and ride capacity at the Westfield Montgomery Transit Center, $60 million towards the design of bus rapid transit in the I-270 corridor, and $300 million over the next few decades to help fund BRT. These commitments were conditions for our support to advance the project forward to the next stage, and we hope and expect that the Moore administration will not only honor those commitments, but will double down on its commitment to a multimodal approach and will build upon those commitments that have been made to the county as part of this uh, ultimate project, and we hope to have it formally adopted as part of the CTP moving forward. Thank you so much for your time and for allowing the council to weigh in on this, and we look forward to our continued partnership at the county and the state level. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Vice President um, Friedson, um, the county executive and the council, um, as they are on most days, are in quite alignment on, on uh, the issues of priorities for the community. 
I want to thank uh, Senator Creamer and Delegate Polakovich Carr for giving us the opportunity to speak. Um, we echo the condolences for the loss of your colleague. It's a loss for the people of the state of Maryland um, and certainly for his family and friends. Um, uh, I also want to take a moment um, to thank, uh, you're going to be hearing from Rockville Mayor Bridget Newton, um, who is in her last two weeks in office. And um, I just wanted to say on behalf of the county executive, I'm sure our colleagues on the council, all 10,000 county employees, many of us who called Rockville our daytime home, thank you for all your work and your service <laughs> on behalf of the people of, of, Montgomery, of Montgomery County. Uh, we look forward to working with Mayor-elect um, Ashton to um, continue the, the great work between the county government and the city of Rockville, and of course our partners in the city of Gaithersburg. Um, you know, the county executive is so pleased with the opportunity to work with you, Secretary Wiedefeld, um, your wonderful colleagues with the Department of Transportation, um, with uh, Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller, a Montgomery County resident and a former engineer and a longtime employee of the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Our expectations for the more Miller administration when it comes to transportation are a little elevated compared to um, maybe what we saw over the last eight years. So. Um, we are very excited to be working um, with, with this team, and I'm sure the Lieutenant Governor will make sure that every one of these items on this page are, are taken care of, um, because we know where she lives, right? So um, uh, once again, I want to thank, and the County Executive wants to thank the excellent work that our delegation has done and continues to do every day, representing our interests, moving the state forward and dealing with our, with our priorities. Um, certainly a special shout out to um, Delegate Corman, who is here, who is part of the commission, and um, I know is going to deliver again on almost everything that you heard um, uh, Council Member Friedson say. Oh, he's ducking now. I'm sorry about everything. So, but um, we're very excited to have him as the new chair of the Environment and Transportation Committee in the, in the House of Delegates and, and look forward to working um, with him. So, um, the county executive has been very clear with the need to come up with an investment in infrastructure. For those of you, and I'm sure many of you have taken time to participate or watch online one of our uh, budget town hall uh, meetings um, where you hear the county executive talk about the need for infrastructure improvements in the county because it is our need to compete with the improvements that have been made in the District of Columbia and certainly with our neighbors in Northern Virginia. And we need you to be a partner in that. We need the legislature to be a partner in that in providing us with the flexibility to raise some of the revenues, to do, to do some of the same policies that Virginia has implemented in order for us to do the infrastructure improvements that are necessary for us to provide opportunities for our residents, our visitors, and our businesses, as well as our ability to compete with Northern Virginia because everyone knows Bethesda is far better than South Bethesda, which they might call the Tysons. So we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we are positioned for the future. Virginia has dedicated funding to infrastructure through regional programs, a sales tax increment, commercial property tax, and special taxing districts that they are aggressive at using to fund infrastructure. The county executive would love to see Maryland positioned to do the same thing so that, again, we can deliver the same type of improvements that Virginia has been promising and delivering for um, the last several decades. Virginia's regional funding and project prioritization approach deliver the most benefit for the dollars invested. Montgomery County and Maryland needs these tools or ones like them in order to succeed. We want to partner with you, with the governor and lieutenant governor, and our legislature in order to deliver them. We also need MDOT to have a reasonably funded program and to be able to execute and eff effectively meet statewide and regional needs. I think the county executive is willing to be a partner for you, for the governor and the lieutenant governor in order to make sure those funding sources are, are considered and hopefully move forward so that we can deliver the type of infrastructure the public demands. Solutions are needed now so that we can invest and compete in today's opportunities and those coming tomorrow. Cuts to state transportation projects and programs will only set us back further, leave us in more congestion and less competitive with Northern Virginia. Key investments that need to happen, as you heard from the Council Vice President, stabilizing Metro, finishing the Purple Line, 
partnering to realize the potential of the North Bethesda and Wheaton metro stations. The Council Vice President has spent a lot of time talking to me about the north entrance to the North Bethesda metro station and what that would do to increase, increase ridership and the development of that property, which you heard um, referenced before about the transportation, the, the transit-oriented development, that that is primed and ready to go. Um, improving US 29, improving access to Clarksburg, and advancing bus rapid transit, which of course the county executive has been a champion uh, for, for the last, for more than the last decade. You know, when you think of all of the different routes and especially rebuilding um, 355 for bus rapid transit, you would be building what I would like to call Maryland's Main Street for the 21st century. When you think of the economic activity for the state of Maryland that happens within the 355 corridor, it is central, it is in many ways, Maryland's Main Street in the 21st century and we need to have a modern transportation system that can deliver um, rapid transit services and meet the demands of the future. Um, along with the Council Vice President and the Council, we applaud the start of the 270 North study. Um, we're thrilled to hear your um, number of open houses that are going to occur um, to engage the public. Um, and of course, the County Executive would like to caution all of you to to not stay too close to the prior administration's plan for the 274-95 project. Obviously, you know, I think one of his first speeches, he said, that's deal with the bridge, that's start with the bridge, that's find a way to pay the bridge, to pay for the bridge. And um, we're thrilled that the, the Moore Miller administration is moving forward with trying to get federal funds and trying to trying to come up with a plan that doesn't overburden motorists by having such high toll rates and obviously getting federal funds. Um, to deal with the bridge um, is a great way to reduce the overall um, task uh, cost of the project um, using the Maryland Transportation um, Authority to be able to fund all or part of it. Again, is a way that we can deliver good product, uh, projects just like the Intercounty Connector, mm -hmm. which was a project of the Maryland Transportation Authority with the State Highway Administration. He would like to make sure you minimize the footprints um, to avoid the impacts on the existing um, neighborhoods, mitigate, mitigate highway noise before beginning construction of the new facilities, and to rethink project the project to ensure equity and reasonable tolls, as I've mentioned, if tolls are needed at all. The state does this on other facilities already. And of course, as the council vice president eloquently said, we need to meet the transit commitments that were there as part of the initial plan because it's essential for us to be able to move forward with bus rapid transit as was promised. Some other key um, investments that I would want to mention, again, reiterating the need to close the fiscal cliff with WMATA. WMATA, a failing WMATA is hurts people who are transit dependent, hurts our regional economy, and is certainly not where we want to go um, Rumor has it you are familiar with WMATA, so um, I'm hopeful that your leadership will continue to move us forward. Again, um, we look forward to um, doubling down on uh, Vision Zero improvements and working with you with all of the, all of the improvements that um, you want to make since obviously this road network is something we share um, and we need to make sure um, we continue to work to make sure our pedestrians are safe. And of course, as we get to this period of time of the year where um, pedestrians are at greatest risk because of the sun going down during the evening, often before the evening rush hour, a plea to anyone watching to, to make sure you're cautious because this is a, um, we have way too many um, tragedies that occur because people are still trying to cross the road where they were but it's now dark and they're not realizing um, the risk that they're at. So um, again, we would like you to address the community concerns raised about the, cha the, the changes to Georgia Avenue um, with the project in Montgomery Hills, which is the area, if you're not familiar, of Georgia Avenue just inside um, 495. And we thank you again for your constructive engagement with Montgomery County, with all of your work, the difference of your leadership is notable and we appreciate the engagement. We look forward 
to it continuing and we stand ready. Um, the director of transportation, his team, whatever Montgomery County government can do to help you all deliver what we need um, with uh, the roads of Maryland and um, in transit and, tra and transportation infrastructure. With that, I would just um, leave with a plea that um, to Mother Nature that it not be a snowy winter. Um, because we haven't had to clear snow for a long time and, <laughs> and uh, we'd like to keep it that way from a cost and safety standpoint. Thank you so much. I, I did want to recognize uh, Chris Conklin. We have, I think, a very strong partnership. I've, I've dealt with him for years. Um, I think we can communicate very well. And uh, I understand, you know, the, the range of, of, of your priorities. And we're committed to knocking down as many of those as we can. Um, but it's going to take a partnership on some of these, and that's for sure. And so it's good to have a strong partner. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for your dedication to the people of Maryland. Thank you very much. So next, we'll call up our municipal elected officials. We have the mayor of Rockville, Bridget Donald Newton, and council member from Gaithersburg, Neil Harris. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being in the great city of Rockville. I'm Bridget Donald Newton, and for the next 11 days, I'm still the mayor. I am retiring to seek uh, a quieter life, maybe. Um, and I do personally hope we get a lot of snow this year, because <laughs> it'll be nice not to be the mayor during a big snow. <laughs> Um, Secretary Wiederfeld, it is nice to see you, and in this particular um, situation with Maryland, it's wonderful to work with you again. Um, I am testifying on behalf of the Rockville City Council, our staff, and residents. I want to thank MDOT SHA for meeting with us on September 20th to discuss the latest plans for addressing the very real regional congestion on the Memorial Bridge and the very real regional congestion on Northern I-270. We appreciate the opportunity to continue our voice to continue voicing our unanimous concerns about the direction this project is taking in our city. We strongly urge Governor Moore to reject the destructive toll lane proposal in favor of a comprehensive smart growth approach. This administration should be investing in building sustainable transportation options that improve health, protect our climate, and make it easier, safer, and more convenient for all residents to access jobs, food, education, health care, sports and recreation without furthering our dependence on cars. There needs to be a holistic look at the demand for expanded roadway, including the reality that new technologies enable people to work at home and understand how this has impacted the regional transportation network. We continue to have concerns about the modeling process, its rec replicability, sorry, I always stumble on that word, and the need for third parties to be able to follow the footsteps of the modelers. This is an important need for more rigorous and consistent data modeling analysis. The city is advocating for P3 reform legislation in the 2024 session that would revise state law to address this issue and make other necessary improvements to the state's P3 implementation process. Rockville is extremely concerned about the width of the proposed project inside Rockville. We'd like it kept within the present footprint, which actually means the present um, sound walls, because I think the, the right of way may extend just a little bit. We're very concerned with plans for new ramps onto I-270 from West Goody Drive and Wooten Parkway, as these will result in significant impacts on Rockville's neighborhoods and internal traffic patterns. While the new NEPA process formally addresses only north of I-370, the traffic modeling should include traffic through Rockville. Rockville has to be within the scope of study for the effects of Rockville to be effects on Rockville to be clearly understood. We urge Governor Moore to reject this failed proposal from the last administration and develop real solutions to Maryland's transportation needs. We would happily support the governor and your staff in creating effective, equitable options that benefit all commuters and protect our citizens and environment. We also want to bring forward our continued request for increased safety on state roads and intersections in Rockville. And I appreciated very much hearing earlier about your focus on pedestrian safety and Vision Zero. We've previously given the information concerning the highest number of crashes and fatalities to MDOT SHA and shared that the signalized crossings along 355 are too far apart People are crossing the six-lane roadway at mid-block, which is really mid-mile. The mayor and council approved the Rockville Vision Zero Action Plan in 2020, and on October 30th, 2023, we approved the pedestrian master plan. 
These plans will help address our goals of safety along our roadways, but we need your partnership to help on the state roads that traverse Rockville. Rockville Pike, 355, Veers Mill Road, 586, and First Street Norbeck Road, 28. Those are state roads within our city. It is our understanding that SHA is working with staff on the implementation of Visit Zero, Vision Zero and safety improvements at the intersections of 355 and Veers Mill Road. We request additional assistance to ensure that these critical improvements are fully completed. These need to include on all of our state roads, sidewalks and more lighting. Uh, 355 is a very busy pedestrian and bike um, pathway, as you have heard before, um, and a lot of our service workers ride bikes along the sidewalks. There's a steep curb and there's where there are too many curb cuts where people are not looking when they're entering and exiting 355. We ask that you please keep us informed and engaged as we work together to meet the transportation needs of our residents in the best way possible. And I know you'll enjoy working with um, future mayor Monique Ashton. So thank you very much. Oh, that button. Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm a, my name is Neil Harris. I'm a member of the Gaithersburg City Council, uh, and I get another four years as of yesterday, so I'll be seeing you again. Thank you. Um, I'm also, uh, I've, I'm about to complete my ninth year on the council and on the Transportation Planning Board, so I've done a little bit of homework over the years, as uh, Mayor Newton can attest, who we've served side by side there for um, that entire time. Um, in talking to the thousands of voters who showed up uh, in greater numbers than we expected yesterday, one of the themes was transportation. And the issue really was everybody knows we need more housing. We have a, a critical shortage of housing in this region. Um, we have made a very attractive area for people who want to live here. They want to go to school here. They want to have jobs here. Um, but they find that we're not keeping up with the infrastructure. We don't have, uh, as we add housing, we're not adding enough transportation infrastructure. We're not adding enough school infrastructure. We're doing better on the school side, um, but according to all the data I have, we're not keeping up on the transportation side. So I'm going to, even though you've given us a lot of good stuff as you've announced here today, and we're very appreciative of, of it, um, I'm going to tell you I, all the data I've seen, and, a, and I'm a bit of a number cruncher, um, it says that we need more, more, more. Um, in my first year on the Transportation Planning Board, at the end of the year, while I was absorbing a lot of information, uh, one thing jumped out at me, which was a presentation on the 25-year plan for the region that said, in 25 years, uh, congestion is going to be 72 percent worse than it is today. Okay, now I have a day job. I work in Herndon three days a week, and commuting from Gaithersburg to Herndon is no picnic. Um, some days I have to take my son to school. He's a special needs kid who goes to school in Beltsville. Beltsville to Herndon is 32 miles. And it's a minimum of a 90-minute drive in heavy traffic on the Beltway and so and across the bridge. Um, and if there's an accident along the way, uh, there was an accident actually a few months ago that uh, backed up traffic from the Dulles Toll Road in Virginia all the way to Rockville. So we need to do better. Uh, we have a lot of people. Who are, uh, who are telecommuting now, and it has unfortunately reduced usage of transit instead of roads, and that's more of a challenge. So um, what I want to touch on is something that, uh, that Rich Maddalino said uh, on behalf of the county executive, which is Northern Virginia has taken some great strides moving forward, and I'm very jealous of what they're doing. You can see the construction and the many programs that they're doing um, as I commute. Uh, several times a week. Um, they have created a special transportation district that has uh, now spent $4.1 billion in, in, in incremental above what the normal funding level for transportation would be, $4.1 billion over the last 10 years in new transportation projects of all modes, roads, transit, bike, ped, etc. Um, and as Rich said, he's concerned, there's a concern that we're falling behind there and we need to do more. So I know that there's already a commission in place, the train commission, to figure out what to do about transportation funding given the issues with the gasoline tax de diminishing, but I think we need to do more. 
and talking to the business community, and I've attended several large meetings uh, in Northern Virginia, and the business community uh, is in favor of extra, of incremental revenue generation when it's dedicated to uh, tangible improvements in the infrastructure in the region. Um, that's not something I hear a lot of here, but I think we really, really need to rethink how we're funding this. So, and I want to come back to a core issue I've had on the uh, Transportation Planning Board. There's a lot of discussion of what's better, roads, transit, whatever. And it occurred to me after some time that the issue wasn't which mode is better, but the issue was there's not enough money to pay for any of this stuff at the level that we really need to improve. So we need to think much larger and really look at what, not what we think we can generate to replace what used to be the gas tax revenue with comparable revenue, but we need to look at what it's really going to take to move forward in the 21st century to provide the infrastructure that the people who want to live here going forward uh, would, uh, would need in order to uh, have the quality of life that we would like to provide to them. And on a, I've already given you one personal note with my commute. I'll give you a second one. I have two grown daughters We've invested a lot of money in educating and uh, bringing to adulthood here, and they live in North Carolina now in their 40s. Um, and the reason they live in North Carolina is mostly because of quality of life. Um, their quality of life would be better, I think, if they lived closer to me and brought my grandchildren over more. But um, the, the cost of housing, the, cost of the hassles of ca transportation, were really more than they wanted to deal with, and they wanted to live in an area that uh, was paying more attention to that than we are here. So please, for the sake of other people who have children and grandchildren, as well as people who have to commute to work uh, in longer distances, we really need your help. Um, one last point on behalf of Gaithersburg. Uh, we live uh, outside of the reach of WMATA. The Shady Grove Metro Station stops just before they get to us. Um, we're looking forward to the 355 BRT project. Whatever else you can provide us, uh, an increased mark uh, availability, um, expanded metro. I know is on the county's list of uh, of future ideas. I know it's a stretch, but whatever we can do to uh, to support mass transit in our area would be helpful because we haven't got much at this point and we need your help. That's it for now. Thank you very much for your time. If I could, I just want to thank you, Mayor. It's been a pleasure working with you and, and all, the, all the best for you in the future. Great, thank you. We thank our county and municipal partners for being here tonight and for for sharing their insights. Uh, we're now going to go to our uh, state legislative districts and by popular demand within the delegation, we are going in a random order. And we are starting actually with District 19, uh, Senator Kramer and Delegate Stewart are here tonight. I would suggest perhaps Delegate Stewart come on up and let's take a look at what you've got and then I will follow behind you with a couple of things that I have. Here we go. I'm glad that wasn't on the record. Um, it's great to see you all this evening. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for heading down here to Montgomery County. Um, I, I definitely share the sentiments of, uh, I always will think of him as Senator Madaleno, but, Madaleno, but the CA, CAO, that I, I definitely think that a new wind of change is in the air, and I think all of us feel it here with the new administration coming in, and I, I certainly share some of the excitement expressed about working with all of you going forward for the next three and maybe more years. Um, so I certainly uh, want to also echo th thoughts of many of my colleagues that have been shared already regarding the importance of pedestrian safety broadly on state roads. Um, I represent District 19, which includes a lot of the, uh, the middle part of Montgomery County. And unfortunately, the center of Montgomery County geographically has too often meant that we've been the center um, of pedestrian death um, in Montgomery County as well. Our district tends to be just urban enough that we have a lot of pedestrians, but just rural or suburban enough that we also have uh, state roads where high speeds are too often the norm. And that has been a really toxic brood that has led to a lot of folks, especially immigrant families or you know immigrant pedestrians in the corridor between 
Wheaton, Aspen Hill, and Glenmont, who have been most victimized by high speeds uh, for the last several years. Um, so certainly echo those sort of broader macro concerns, as well as some of the thoughts expressed about how important it is to get the purple line up and running, how important it is to stabilize Metro, et cetera. But um, rather than focus too much on those, I want to be extremely parochial and just mention a couple of things in District 19. Um, First, I will start. I have some thank yous and some kind of uh, more work to do. I'll start with the thank yous, as I think is, uh, you know, cordial. Um, so, so first, um, along um, along the Georgia Avenue access road, which is called Old Georgia Avenue, this is abuts the Leisure World, which is kind of the heart of our district in District 19. I um, just want to thank you because the segment on Old Georgia Avenue between um, basically the entrance, the main entrance of Leisure World along Georgia Avenue and Norbeck Row, which is 28, um, has been completed. And that was in really, really rough shape for a while. And I know a lot of Leisure World residents use that to get to the gas station and whatnot. So I want to thank you for that. I think there's still more work to do on sort of the southern part of it, but that's less traveled. So I want to thank you for that. Also, Delegate uh, Crutchfield and Delegate Cullison could not be here, but they gave me a list of thank yous as well. And, and Delegate Crutchfield in particular was insistent that I mentioned that um, to thank you for erecting a traffic uh, device near Glen Allen Elementary School, which is the corner of Randolph and Heurig Road. So she'll be uh, thankful for that I mentioned that. And then in, in the more work to do column, I started actually at 7 p.m. I had like eight or nine of these, and then I thought better of it and narrowed it down to like three or four. Um, I've, I've matured, you know, on the job. This is my fifth year. So um, first um, on uh, Maryland 193 in terms of more work to do, uh, this is University Boulevard at the intersection of Orange Drive. There's basically no crosswalk there. There's a number of bus stops nearby, and we've heard from some of our Kent Mill constituents that it's a really dangerous crossing. Um, SHA promised to do a 90-day study, but unfortunately it, it had been delayed as of September. And so as of now in November, I'm actually not sure of the status of that, but I do hope that we get a study done there in Kent Mill to see if the crosswalk um, could be helpful or some other traffic calming steps could be taken there. Um, the big the big headline as, as, as it relates to pedestrian safety in District 19 remains Georgia Avenue and the safe uh, the unsafety along it. This has been a huge point of emphasis for the District 19 team for years. We continue to lose people every year, um, most recently earlier this year. And one area that we've pointed out um, consistently is a potential crosswalk on Epping Road, E-P-P-I-N-G. I know that this is still under review, but I hope that that's something that you all will pursue. I know that a number of other improvements have been raised and are being worked on in Georgia Avenue, and for that we're really grateful. I know, for example, when the lines were most recently redrawn, the lane uh, that's closest to the sidewalk is in, in ordinary, inordinately large. It's like two-thirds larger than the other lanes, and we all know the importance of lane width in terms of traffic calming. And so it's created a situation where the other lanes are normal, but then you have this road that's closest to where people are walking, and it's basically like the, you know, the Talladega Super Speedway, and pardon the reference, I'm from Alabama, as you might be able to tell from my crimson blazer. Um, and then um, third, and I promise I'm almost done, um, this is a relatively small one, but I just wanted to raise it because I've heard from multiple constituents and we've had a, hard, a little bit harder time getting track with you all on this one. So on Norbeck Road on Maryland 28, there is a potential crosswalk possibility at Carrollton Road. There is a there's an elementary school there. And I have to admit, I'm a little bit biased because it's actually the elementary school that my own sons are going to go to. Um, and there is a concern about a, a basically safe paths to school. There are a lot of um, a lot of neighbors live on the other side of Norbeck Road. They're trying to cross there to get to the Flower Valley Elementary School, and um, they're having to do so without a crosswalk, and there have apparently have been some near misses that have really terrified the neighbors, so I'll mention that. And then last one, and the reason it's last is that I'm, we're actually chatting, I'm chatting with SHA about this tomorrow. So this is not so much a work, more work to do as much as I am just grateful for another opportunity to sit down with you all. This has been something that we've been hearing about for a long, long time, probably even more so than Georgia Avenue, what I hear the most from constituents. And it relates to a stretch uh, of Maryland 115, which is Muncaster Mill Road between Redland Middle School and Magruder High School. Um, basically, the issue is that people have siblings that attend one of the, you know, that one sibling, older sibling goes to the high school, younger sibling goes to the middle school. And it's a very well trafficked area for students going back and forth between those two schools. There's also a number of programs where middle schoolers will go up to the high school for classes or high schoolers will go down to the middle school for a watch some sort of game or some sort of sports practice. And there's no sidewalk. Um, and so they're walking on this state highway 
that can be very, very dangerous. You have cars going 50, 60 miles per hour. And we have had some, we ha did have um, a young middle schooler who was hit a couple of years ago, and we've had a couple of r really near misses there as well. Now, the problem is, the reason something hasn't been done already and the reason that we weren't able to get any traction um, with, with the Hogan administration on this is because there is uh, a creek that basically runs along there that creates an environmental hazard, that, and there's going to have to be some environmental remediation to fix it, and it's not cheap. Um, but um, I stand ready, I mean, whether we have to, you know, beg uh, the Appropriations Committee or the BNT Committee or whatever to try to find some legislative resources or if I need to talk to my friends at the county to try to find some matching funds. It's a really, really important issue in District 19. If we could cross that hurdle, find the couple of million it would take to do the environmental remediation and find some sort of way, even if it's like a raised um, walking path for even a portion of that stretch, I think it would make a difference in a lot of young people's lives in particular. So that was way longer than I wanted to go. But again, I really appreciate, appreciate y'all's time. Thanks for coming down here and giving us the opportunity. And um, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. And it's good to have a meeting tomorrow to, to deal with that one issue. Yeah. Thank you, Delegate Stewart. And I'll be part of that conversation tomorrow. So I look forward to uh, talking with you and staff about the uh, 115. We do have a project that we're kind of working our way through and developing at that location. It's going to be going forward through our area wide. So it'll be, a, it'll be a very fruitful conversation tomorrow. Regarding the crosswalks, I know that um, we're in the home stretch with a couple of those studies. We're just putting the final touches on those. So we'll be getting the results to you very soon. Thank you, sir. And I'd just like to <clears throat> say thanks to my District 19 teammate for um, his comments. I uh, support his concerns, certainly, um, that are focused on the common theme of pedestrian safety. A um, couple of other issues in our district, if I may, and this one, uh, the first is significant, um, but it's certainly uh, problematic, and that is, Mr. Secretary, uh, Route 28 Norbeck Road, which travels uh, through our legislative district as well as uh, Legislative District 14, um, is four lanes from Rockville and then heading east um, at Route 97 George Avenue. It's brought down to two lanes. It is a major east-west arterial in the state and in the county, and it has a stretch for a short period where then it opens up again to four lanes all the way uh, into Prince George's County. So uh, the concern is it is long past time that we address the fact that this major east-west arterial, for whatever reason, was left with this little bottleneck section that really creates uh, a traffic backup um, particularly during uh, rush hour periods, but even non-rush hour. Um, it's a huge problem. It's a uh, huge problem uh, for the communities that are along that area. So I would hope that we really could take a look at moving forward. I know there was a study that was done uh, and completed with regard to the widening um, but it's really time we focused on just getting that one small section uh, improved uh, and how it ended up that way uh, is certainly questionable, but it, it would really help um, with the commute there. Uh, the other <clears throat> two items, um, there will be uh, legislation introduced uh, with regard to uh, putting speed cameras on our inner county connector Route 200. Um, this is a significant issue for both Legislative District 19 and 14. Um, I do appreciate the fact that there has been increased enforcement on the ICC uh, speed control, um, but easily cars routinely are doing 80, 90 miles an hour. It's a beautiful straight road, makes it very easy to accomplish very high speeds. 
Um, I will note that during the Hogan administration, enforcement became almost non-existent. Um, I know there were criticisms during the O'Malley administration that maybe it was overly enforced. Um, so we went from one extreme to the other. Um, it has also become, and uh, our Maryland State Police have acknowledged that they know that motorcycle racing on the uh, ICC is a significant issue. Uh, they were working to push it off the beltway and succeeded to a large degree. And what ended up happening was a lot of that got pushed on to the ICC. So I will hope that uh, we get support for speed cameras. Uh, we know they work. Um, we really need to address um, the problems, the quality of life for the people who reside along the intercounty connector. There were studies done not long ago um, that showed the difference in noise increases every five miles per hour because uh, there was discussion about raising the speed limit on the ICC. Uh, I believe the sound barriers had been installed to a specific speed, which it had been uh, 55. It has been raised to 60. Um, and it was during that period of time that there was a lot of discussion about this dramatic increase in the volume of noise for every five miles per hour. And that's why it ended up being capped at 60, but that's not what the uh, typical vehicle uh, traffic is is doing so I hope we can work with uh, with you and the Maryland Transportation Authority folks uh, to help address that uh, finally uh, mr. secretary if you get back to your office tomorrow and you'll pull out the sofa cushions uh, look for whatever change is is laying back there this one's easy um, the community of leisure world is seeking a screening fence on Route 97, Georgia Avenue, um, under Secretary uh, Slater's time uh, as administrator. He uh, provided screening from the Georgia Avenue entrance at Leisure World north to Route 28 Norbeck Road. And now the community would like something comparable. It's approximately the same uh, distance from the entrance going to the southern end of the community. Um, again, the problem there has been that traffic on Route 97 Georgia Avenue in front of the Leisure World community has increased dramatically. Uh, over the past 25 plus years. I believe when we looked into it, that was the last time traffic studies had been done in that section of the corridor. Again, quality of life with the high volume of noise and the visibility of the traffic there. Um, so it's a small ask from the community. Uh, God bless Andre Futrell. He has been working closely uh, with the community. He has spent a lot of time out there. Um, he's another gem that you have. And uh, we've got the area staked out. We know exactly the distance. Uh, the cost should be very nominal for the benefit. So I hope to get that on your radar and see if maybe that is something we can knock out at this point. Uh, hopefully very soon. So I uh, thank you for your attention to that and uh, appreciate the opportunity just to let you know what's happening. Thank you. Thanks, and I obviously will look into the screening issue, get a little bit more background on it, if I may. Um, in terms of, uh, as was mentioned by, by uh, Chrissy Neiser, speed is you know one of the critical elements that lead to fatalities. Uh, I know the Lieutenant Governor is uh, we've set up a task force that the lieutenant governor is leading, um, and so I think I think we will soon see from both the department and with your assistance a much more aggr aggressive approach towards some of these issues, particularly in work zones, um, but across the board. So I think we can work together with you on that as well. On the 28 Norback Road, I don't uh, know if there's any. Just a quick comment on Route 28. We'll work with um, Chris on that. I, we think that there is a stretch that will provide you the limits. A portion of that is actually county 
roadway. So that I think is is the reason why it's different than the rest of the portion there. So we'll kind of work on a follow up on to give you specifics on that. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. that very much. Thank you, Senator Kramer. Next up, District 9A, Delegate Ziegler. Good evening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Nice to see you again. I was in the Howard County <laughs> presentation last week. Um, so I want to start off with a question I have from Senator Hester, who was not able to be here but who is watching online. Um, well, it's a question and, and also an ask, I suppose. I wanted to see if there's an update on the Maryland 355 share use path in Clarksburg. Good, Tim, I think. Anybody know anything? Does anyone have any right now? Can you give me a minute? I have He's, a lot of notes. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I can't even carry that book, so it's Chris, right. could you <laughs> help us? <laughs> I think Chris might be able to help us a bit there. Or, Sorry. Oh, that's quite Hi, right. Chris Coughlin, Montgomery County DOT. It's a county project that's under construction right now. I don't know what other questions you have about it. Fantastic. That's great. Just to find out when it, when it would be completed, it's a big uh, District 9 priority. So. I don't have a completion date here today, but I can certainly get one to you. Well, it's great to know it's underway. Thank you very much. Um, and I really did not mean to put you on the spot. I have <laughs> like 10,000 things going on here. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about uh, that voters have complained to me about is on 355, again, heading north towards the Frederick County line from Clarksburg, um, there, are, there must be a tremendous amount of construction going on in Frederick County because there are really heavy trucks, lines and lines of really heavy trucks that I am guessing are bypassing the way station on the interstate and they're using 355. And the people who live there, the noise is incredible. And it's certainly not great for the road. So that's just something I wanted to bring up. And then the last thing um, is a small thing, but it's a big deal for the residents. Uh, the Victory Haven income restricted senior apartments on Main Street in Damascus, um, it's a Housing Opportunities Commission property, has a sidewalk that runs along Main Street but there's a break in it. And the reason for that is that there was a strange sort of pie-shaped piece of property that belonged to an estate. And I think uh, they had trouble getting title to it. But I was promised in the, in the last session, which was my first session, um, that they would be able to complete that sidewalk. So, so many of these residents use either a wheelchair, a rollator, a walker. And with wheels, you can't get across the grass when it's wet and muddy, which it often is. So you can see how you could get to shopping or the senior center, but you can't get there. And I just want to pray that that's really going to happen. And in addition, um, that there be a really good crosswalk put in uh, to cross that street. Because as I say, many of the residents are older and infirm. And I actually door knocking had met people across the street who asked for that because they just were concerned watching people uh, attempt this crossing and uh, were afraid they were going to come to grief. So thank you so much. You. That's it. If you wouldn't mind, could you repeat the location one more time? I was tr intently yes, listening, but no I just want to make sure I got it. It's uh, the building is called Victory Haven and it's on May. I think it's 9616 Main Street in Damascus. It's a really large income restricted uh, senior senior apartment. It's a very big complex. And it, you can look at it on Google Maps. You can see you can see where it is. It's not it's short. I mean it's probably the distance of this room at the most. Um, but it's meaningful. Okay, thank so, you for the great. additional clarity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Ziegler. Next up, District 16, Delegates Corman and Woolock. It 
it's Henri. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming um, and for your presentation. It's been insightful uh, for me as a newbie here. Um, I've been in this role now for six months, but it's uh, in my district, there's a lot of interest and concerns around uh, pedestrian safety um, and particular intersections that uh, affect our residents. I'm going to talk about some of them, as well as the bigger project with 495 and the plans there. Uh, one I wanted to speak to you about directly at the onset is the River Road project. I want to begin by saying that um, it's been actually a real pleasure working with uh, SHA. Um, we have had, at least in my experience, really uh, a positive response on some of the issues that my uh, constituents have brought up. One of them was uh, invasive species that were very much uh, out of control and folks came out and addressed them right away. The long-term uh, issue with that is that it, it's ad hoc and it is, um, you know, we, we may bring up an issue and somebody may come out and address it, but there isn't uh, a plan around um, addressing it more broadly. So thinking through um, not on a one by one basis, but sort of broader would be helpful. Um, on the River Road uh, project, um, again, the engagement is uh, much appreciated. I think positive communication um, with the residents of our district would also be really helpful. There's a lot of concern around safety, especially given the bike accident of Sarah Langenkamp in that area. So we are looking forward to seeing what that redevelopment looks like. I think the plan is in the works. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up are bike lanes on Goldsboro. This has been brought up uh, several times to me and we have shared that concern as well, along with sidewalks on that particular street because um, pedestrian state safety, especially because there are bus stops on that uh, a stretch between sort of MacArthur and River on Goldsboro. Um, there are two bus stops, but there isn't a crosswalk um, to get from one part of the road to the other. Uh, there also aren't, aren't sidewalks. If you get off the bus, where are you walking? Goldsboro is a very busy street. Um, so those are some priority areas and then, in addition, this big project that uh, is proposed with regard to the bridge, that backs up right into our district. Many of our my neighbors, um, the residents of District 16, are going to be impacted by that project. And so I am going to advocate for you to be really um, proactive in your communication mm -hmm. with our constituents there, because it's going to impact them very much. Um, and I know that the open houses are planned. Uh, I don't know if the schedule is outlined yet, but uh, if it is, um, you know, we want to be able to push things out as quickly as possible within our community. The open houses are a great start. I would love to see if there are more uh, ideas you have around engagement so that people feel that they know, one, what's going on, because there's a lot of anxiety around that. There needs to be a solution for sure, but to the extent that people can feel pulled in and part of the process will make it a better solution, whatever that ends up being. So I do really want to put that on your radar uh, um, in terms of comms to the extent that you can to do that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my teammate who has much more experience and depth both in this topic and um, in this district. Thank you, Delegate Wallach. On behalf of uh, Senator Kelly, Delegate Love, Delegate Wallach, of course, and myself, I uh, want to bring a few District 16 related issues to your attention. Obviously, I spend a lot of time uh, with each and every one of you, and uh, you know, we'll try to keep this more focused on District 16. I will say broadly, though, on the transportation budget, um, it is out of balance. Um, it's out of balance, and you're not even funding the priorities that the governor's laid out, to say nothing of all the priorities you're hearing from the folks in this room. And I think. Um, uh, you should be submitting drafts that are uh, in balance is my recommendation for the future and uh, making some of those tough choices and then coming around to the counties to hear uh, how those choices should look different. But right now there's a total disconnect with uh, what's going on in the county communication and um, 
what your uh, what your documents look like, unfortunately. Um, one of the major issues for our district, as Delegate Wallach said, is the American Leader Bridge and, and I-270. There are a lot of questions. There's a lot of confusion. Really appreciate the open houses, particularly appreciate you adding a weekend open house at the request of many of us. Uh, I don't think my colleagues appreciate it, but I really appreciate it. I know a lot of my constituents uh, do as well, so I will see you there on that Saturday morning at Wooten High School. Um, some of the questions are um, how the lower portion of 270 is supposed to be expanded when we're trying to fix bottlenecks on 495 and then upper 270, won't that just uh, restore the bottlenecks? Uh, there's a lot of questions about the right of way, uh, which you heard from Mayor Newton from Rockville, but it is an issue along the entire uh, corridor. There's a lot of questions about whether or not River Road actually needs on-ramps to the toll lanes or if that makes the footprint too big. Uh, there's questions about um, bus plans. One of the ideas that you all seem to be putting forward is that um, these additional lanes can be uh, more of transit lanes than just uh, Lexus lanes, um, which is fine, but not a lot of uh, detail on how that will actually work, how that will be funded on a sustainable basis, given the funding challenges you all uh, face. As you know, you inherited uh, a lack of trust from a lot of people in the community, and we're looking for that trust uh, to be restored by answers to some of these questions. So since I'm supposed to be asking questions, I will ask, do we have your commitment, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Administrator, and I guess MDTA as well because of the toll uh, aspect of this, to work with us to restore that trust in some of the ways Delegate Wallach was describing with your outreach? Yes, of course. I mean, and uh, I think you'll see that uh, going forward uh, with these with these outreach meetings. Um, and we're open with, with any other suge suggestions you have to improve that. Right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, I'll shift to a topic that, as everyone's noted, you know quite a lot about, which is the, the metro system. Uh, I just want to say I really appreciate that uh, Drew Morrison is up there representing, the, I guess, the WSTC, the Washington Suburban Transit Commission. That's new. As you well know, it has not been treated as a full mode before, despite the uh, very significant um, uh, financial commitment that the state makes. So I think it's really great that um, you're treating it as a mode. I think that's a very positive development, and I think um, bodes well for addressing this uh, fiscal cliff that uh, Metro is facing, which is extremely important to Montgomery County as a whole, but particularly District 16. We have the Friendship Heights Metro Station, Bethesda, Medical Center, Grosvenor, and uh, North Bethesda. So it's really important. So do we have your commitment to work with our regional partners on addressing the, the fiscal cliff at Metro? Uh, yes. Um, I think we have been working closely and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but as you, as you mentioned, you know, I, I look at this a little differently than maybe historically the departments looked at it. I think it. Uh, I think we need to be a much larger player in all the discussions down there with, you know, with our delegation with the county. But uh, when we represent ourselves at WMATA, I think we need to represent as as a whole as we go go uh, as we deal with the dealings uh, deal with issues down there. So I, I appreciate your support for that. Yeah, and I appreciate your commitment. This is, I think, my 11th or 12th one of these meetings. I came in them before I was in office, and I'll say across the board, this was the most Montgomery County specific in the presentations you all gave before we all got it up here and started talking from each of the modes. So thank you for that. Um, uh, on to the State Highway Administration more specifically. Um, Old Georgetown Road has been a significant issue in District 16. Um, we had the death of Jake Castle and Enzo Alabarenga, as well as a lot of other uh, serious injuries, and State Highway took action. It was controversial action, but you took action, which I really uh, appreciate. Um, obviously, there's still a lot of questions and concerns in the community, so we just want your commitment, Administrator Pines, or of course, your wonderful district engineer, Derek Gunn, who works with us very closely, uh, to continue the monitoring effort on Old Georgetown Road, so that we're continuing to sort of report back the data to our constituents to show if these bike lanes are uh, working, both in terms of uh, mobility, but also the, the safety uh, enhancements that they're designed for. Sure, happy to continue working with you on providing any data needed to help work with constituents on that. Um, as we work together on projects throughout the county, statewide, uh, it becomes really critical to make sure that that balance between mobility and safety is, is discussed a lot up front. That's something that we're going to be working on as part of that outreach effort that we've been talking about for ALB, but all, really all of our projects, to make sure that when we are prioritizing safety and it has an impact on mobility, that that's really clear up front because obviously there there are frustrations at the end when when motorists realize the uh, the impacts to their drive. So we want to get that right going forward. But in, in this particular case, absolutely, we'll, we'll work with you to make sure you get the data that that's needed to have those discussions. And, and thank you, Mr. To my colleague, Delegate Wallace, one about communication. I think this time a year ago, the, the bike lanes went in, and I, I certainly personally wasn't prepared and did a poor job preparing my constituents 
for the immediate impacts, which are different than the impacts they're facing today, right? The immediate change uh, led to some really challenging months. A lot of that has uh, been alleviated, although there's still, again, a lot of questions and concerns. I'll just say, maybe not in the form of a question, but more broadly, you know, we heard from Delegate Wallach about River Road, about Goldsboro Road. We have issues. I'm sorry, I'm not giving you the MD numbers. I can I can look some of them up. If, uh, we don't know if I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, Bradley, Wilson, Wisconsin. On each of these, we have safety, mobility, flooding, trimming uh, issues, and uh, just really need your commitment to keep working with us. And again, in a more holistic way, not in just a we report something needs to be mowed and you go out and mow it, but make sure that we're out there before the people are complaining about the the mowing. So appreciate that. Uh, I'll turn to uh, the Maryland Transit Administration. Um, the Purple Line is obviously a huge priority for Montgomery County and really appreciate the efforts of the administration, the secretary, the administrator to sort of pull it over the, the finish line. Um, one issue that we get a lot of questions about, I view the Purple Line as, as, as an additive, but one of the, the, the detractions of it was the closing on a temporary basis of the Capitol Crescent Trail. Uh, I know that people would like to see more transparency into the status of the trails Reconstruction. So, can we have your recommitment, uh, your commitment, excuse me, to a sort of more public discussion of the work on the trail, not just the the purple line as a whole, but the trail specifically? Yeah, we're absolutely happy to provide updates on that. Um, I will reiterate when I, since I have the mic, that we will not open the trail until it's safe to do so, and so we may complete work on the trail prior to the purple line. Um, but we need to make sure that it's safe overall before we do open it. But we are committed to continuing that work, and we'll be more transparent about it. Sure, and I'll defer to Delegate Solomon to fight about that last point. But I just want to be able to give people the the information. Uh, and on that front, uh, can we also have your commitment on the openness to the overall? schedule, uh, which has moved back considerably uh, over the years, predating many of you. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, hopefully we're closing in on a, a, an actual firm uh, end game, but, you know, just want as much notice and openness as possible in the overall schedule for the project. Is that something you all agree to? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we will continue to, to be transparent about that. We're looking at different ways to report on the milestones that are maybe a little bit more clear than the ones we've done previously, and we're happy to continue those conversations. Terrific. And, um, you know, we've heard a lot about the sort of 270 corridor. There's another aspect to that, which is the, the transit aspect. We have a, uh, a train line that actually runs along that corridor called the Brunswick Line, part of the really well-named Mark Rail system. Um, can we just have your commitment to um, maximize any opportunities you can find there? Because anybody we can get on those trains and off of the uh, roadway is, uh, is a win uh, if it works for their lives and schedules. Absolutely, and I will give a plug again to our Mark Growth and Transformation Plan, and I encourage you and your constituents to complete the survey there because it's helpful for us to know what the desires are, right? Is it more midday service, weekend, weeknight? Uh, that's all helpful for us as we're looking to make decisions um, as we advance these projects. Yep, but as you know, Ben and I, we've had a lot of studies, we've had a lot of uh, plans, we've had a lot of surveys. The decisions is the, is the key. Uh, to my friends at the Motor Vehicle Administration and the uh, Aviation Administration, welcome to Montgomery County. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Delegate Wolick, I just want to comment that um, I, I already got a text earlier from one of the other uh, delegations saying that they didn't have the dates for the meeting. I'm going to make sure we do a distribution to everyone for the open house dates that's here to so that everybody has that in case that was missed. So. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you. Next, we're going to District 14, Delegates Kaiser and New York North. One second. I just want to thank you all very much uh, for for being here tonight in Montgomery County and being here for, for all of our questions. Obviously, sitting next to me is Delegate Miraku North, but also speaking tonight on behalf of Senator Zucker and uh, Delegate Queen as well. I think to answer Delegate Stewart's concern, it, it, it wasn't random at all. Um, they hated us going first because our district would always do a PowerPoint and put every other district <laughs> It's a shame, and so that's why we were, we were, we were moved to a different spot. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, I mean, if I ask any question tonight, it's please, please answer all of Delegate Corman's questions. That would be, 
That would be my number one. I'm going to pass this off to Delegate Mercury North in a second. But again, want to thank you for the updates on the construction uh, traffic um, issues in our county and, and for all, all the work uh, that all of you do. And I specifically add to um, uh, Ms. Neiser, my, my visit to the MBA last week was uh, amazing. Um, so in and out in less than 10 minutes. So it was, it was fantastic. Um, and so I'm really just gonna pass on our constituent priorities. I was just here for the humor um, and, <laughs> and pass along the uh, material to Delegate Mayor note. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for coming down to Montgomery County. And um, I, I also wanna express my, my sympathy to um, uh, the, the past um, uh, administrator. Um, he clearly was quite a bright light. And so I'm just um, thankful to hear a little more about him tonight. And I appreciate you. Um, uh, uh, be able to schedule another time to see us. Um, so in current, uh, regarding our constituent priorities, we appreciate our asking for um, the Laytonsville bypass to remain a priority. Um, just recently, we celebrated about uh, 50 years of advocacy uh, for the Brookville bypass, and uh, Administrator Pines was, was with us, as well as the delegation and others to celebrate um, that victory. Um, we're hoping for a shorter time frame for the Laytonsville uh, bypass, but nevertheless, we want that to be a priority um, once again. Uh, the District 4 team has secured this past session uh, about 300 additional street lights on U.S. 29 and we're just asking for the status of that project it was um, funds allocated um, for 29 and I know there are some other projects that were uh, unfunded um, based upon the report that was recently um, provided and also wanted to bring up the fact that that for that particular uh, area of 29 there were a number of uh, op well there were some opportunities to visit federal funding and district 14 team brought that up last time uh, we were before you guys. Well, well, the rest of the team was before you guys. I'm relatively new, I'm like 10 months in. But last year, there was a discussion on federal funding under the Biden-Harris administration, the Reconnecting Community Grants Program. I understand that there's currently um, a community connections funds for Forest Glen, Wheaton, Glenmont area. Uh, and I'm very thankful for that project uh, being up and running, but we're looking to have the similar funding for the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan. Uh, Delegate Queen specifically had went to a seminar, um, sorry, a webinar about this federal grant program and agreed along with the rest of us that that particular grant funding is a perfect fit for the Fairland Briggs Cheney Master Plan. So we, uh, as mentioned earlier about the quest to seek federal funding, we're asking for a particular emphasis on the Fairland um, Briggs Cheney Master Plan and getting federal funding for that particular sector of our district. Um, now with respect to the other um, projects that were unfunded um, regarding uh, the plan that was provided for you guys uh, from you guys uh, there were a number of projects mostly along 29 that we are you know curious as to why they weren't um, funded uh, 29 interchange at Musgrove and Fairland Road 29 at Stewart Lane uh, 29 Tech Road, uh, 29 at Greencastle Boulevard, 29 at Blackburn, um, as well as uh, Maryland 124, Willfield Road, um, and there's two phases of that. Now, granted, most of the uh, half of those are literally in our district, but the other half um, really complement our district. Uh, they are in District 20, 1939, but it's all encompassing to making sure that we, we wanted to put this on your radar, that we are watching it. We are wanting to see how this is going to develop and how this project is going to get funded. I, I vividly remember seeing a, a family of three on Greencastle 29, a little kid and his parents waiting to cross the street. And as I see these funding, these projects not being funded, I say, well, how soon can we get these roads to be safer for that family of three to cross the street? And so we're just asking to uh, make sure that you keep these projects on your radar um, going forward. Um, and yeah, of course, it's gonna require state and county collaboration. Um, so we're just looking forward to um, having those collaborations begin um, as soon as possible. I think we've covered everything. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> First time to charm. So thank you very much. Just high level, I'll comment that Please. we understand the, the interest in a corridor wide approach to US 29. Uh, it's gonna be in partnership with the county. There's been a lot of activity on this over the years with different studies. Some of them went fairly far with some interchange options that aren't really favorable at this point. So I think we are at a, at a fresh look at that uh, point. So um, if you wanna add any more, Derek. Thank you, Administrator Pines. Uh, we are working with the county and partners on multimodal scenarios and options along the 29 corridor. Uh, 
I think you mentioned US 29 at Stewart. Uh, there mm -hmm. is a project right now that's, I believe it's going to advertise in fall of 2024, and that's looking at some options. It's looking at an interchange reconfiguration and some comprehensive pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements at that location. So we can keep you updated on uh, how that progresses. Awesome, thank you. That's it, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, moving to District 15, Delegates Chi and Foley. Good evening. Thank you very much, Secretary Whitfeld and uh, Senior. Uh, leaders of MDOT. I am Delegate Lily Chi. I uh, represent District 15 along with my good colleague Dele Delegate Linda Foley and we are here also represent our colleagues who cannot make it today including Senator Brian Feldman and our other delegate uh, David Fraser Hidalgo who is very much of a champion for uh, transportation. Um, he used to chair the transportation subcommittee as you know. Um, before I go on to focus on pedestrian safety issues, which is a huge challenge for our district, which is roughly from Potomac to Postville. Um, as you can imagine, representing Western and Upper Montgomery County, it's probably the least walkable of all districts uh, in Montgomery County. Um, so that is and continues to be a pressing issue. But we first want to press this administration and MDOT to use whatever political capital you have on the table to please move forward the reopening of White's Ferry. Um, our community can no longer accept the argument that because it is a private dispute between two private parties that there's not much government can do on both sides of the Potomac. I think this is why government exists. When something is clearly and squarely in the public interest, we have to step forward and figure out a way to move forward because it has a huge, tremendous impact, not just in terms of economic impact, but in terms of community morale. And it's a symbol of government dysfunction when there's absolutely nothing we can do and just kind of throwing the towel. Um, it's been almost three years now. Um, it's time to figure out um, a way forward. So beyond that, um, I want to focus on um, you mentioned earlier, and I appreciate the comments uh, among the three priorities I heard about the pedestrian safety, which is music to my ears. Um, I want to continue uh, what I mentioned last year, which is um, about con uh, pedestrian safety initiatives in District 15. So last year, as you, um, well, it's a new administration, so I shouldn't say as you recall, but last year, your department did step up to help, and I want to uh, give you my appreciation. Um, so in Clarksburg, uh, which is actually quite concentrated up county area with a, a, quite a bit of a density, we have Clarksburg High School and the Rocky Hill Middle School that are next to each other across 355. And it's a busy stretch um, with a lot of kids having to walk without sidewalk to schools. Some, sometimes kids are as young as 11 years old having to make the judgment call of when to cross. Uh, so we are... Uh, so we request the crosswalk as well as sidewalk. Okay, I'm pleased that, that after two years of going back and forth, we finally, you know, working with the parent advocates and working uh, with the county MCDOT and with S uh, SHA, we are finally getting a sidewalk, um, and it will be uh, completed later this year. Uh, while that is exciting, it did take two years of going back and forth. So my plea here is if we could separate school zone pedestrian safety projects from the rest of the pedestrian safety projects because by law our kids have to go to school and with no uh, walkability parents are forced to drive which makes the situation even worse for the kids um, so I, I you know I hope it's not just for new schools which we have a system in place now but we also need to look at existing schools especially in those uh, areas where residents don't live on a grid that can easily walk to bus stops and things like that um, and let's see. So um, the second point I want to make is we need greater clarity uh, in both the decision making of new projects, uh, like when you decide to pull the trigger to move forward on the new project and the tracking of existing projects. 
uh, because on several occasions, our office has been told that certain roads near schools do not qualify for speed mitigation or pedestrian safety measures because the amount of traffic is not high enough. But we also uh, learned that oftentimes these studies were completed in the summertime when schools are not in session to be accurate in your measurement. Um, and I have also requested other speed mitigation tools, such as speed cameras, dynamic display signs, um, and uh, speed bumps. But um, often I have been told that the locations do not meet necessary requirements. It's harder. It's hard for us um, to explain to our constituents who complained without knowing the details. If there's a way for us to understand how you measure and how we can articulate your reasons. That would be super helpful. Um, and the one last point I would like to mention is that tracking of the smaller projects. I think MDOT is, does a pretty good job displaying the major projects on your website so the people can track. Um, but majority of the projects are small, and so they are not displayed. And so the only way for us to find out the status is to keep bothering people <laughs> uh, at the appropriate departments if we know who to bother. Uh, and that it means it, we're at the mercy of people finding the emails and finding the right person, writing answers, and having a time to respond, all of that. And sometimes people have partial answers and all of that. So that becomes very convoluted and a big challenge for us. And I think it's a waste of everybody's time and energy. So if there's a way to use better technology to better update and just just make the whole process more uh, transparent and efficient, uh, that will be serving everyone's purpose. So thank you very much. I could comment on that last point. Um, happy that we're, we've actually gotten that comment a couple of times, yeah. and the project portal website that displays projects, we're working on revamping which specific projects. We know we need to kind of go deeper. We have thousands of projects, and we don't want to inundate with stuff that's irrelevant. Uh, you know, research things that people just don't care about, but we I, we need to get a better alignment on what is of interest. And so um, we'll reach out to you actually to kind of get your take on that. We've t met with some other delegation to kind of get their perspectives, um, but happy to kind of hear hear where the interests lie. We're working Thank on you. updating that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, as uh, my colleague uh, Delegate Chi said, I'm Delegate Linda Foley, and. Uh, I, uh, I just want to pick up uh, also on the comments regarding White's Ferry. Um, it may seem like a small, quaint project, the White's Ferry, but actually people may not know that it carried at its peak something like 600 cars a day. So that does relieve, I mean, it is really the only crossing, public crossing between Leesburg and the American Legion Bridge. Um, and it does have a great impact on the western part of the county uh, economically. Uh, since it's been closed. I know, Secretary Wiedefeld, we've reached out to you and you have been responsive. I also do want to give a shout out to Chris Conglin, who's really been working on this. Uh, as and it, and it is a very difficult problem because there are two uh, private parties involved, but um, uh, we're not going to give up <laughs> because it's too important to the western part of the county and really to the county as a whole. Um, so I hope that we're able to uh, redouble our efforts now that maybe we have a more transit-friendly environment in Northern Virginia uh, and in Virginia as a whole. Maybe we can make some progress there. I hope so. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about I-270. Um, we, uh, we did have our own uh, hearing on I-270 and other projects, but to focus mo mainly on I-270 in the Up County um, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and I think uh, I took away from that, that um, from that hearing anyway, that the feeling in our district seems to be that the northern end of I-270, that is from I-370 north, is really where we need to focus on widening the road. I think uh, our district is unique in that we're really split as a district about that whole project. Uh, a lot of my members feel have the same sentiments as my chairman, Mark Corman, uh, expressed, but also a lot of our um, uh, constituents really need to have I-270 widened and improved so that they can get to work from the northern and western parts of the county. But I think the feeling was that 
focusing on the northern end rather than the southern end of I, as far as the I-270 part of this goes, uh, is, uh, is, is important. Because um, that's really where the bottleneck is for our constituents, I think. And then the other thing, and I know you know this, but I just want to state it for the record. The other thing is, is that when I-270 backs up, then particularly in the morning, then that sends all the traffic into the into the roads in our district. And as Delegate Chi said, our district is not that pedestrian friendly. And uh, it's not, uh, you know, we do have a lot of people that bike on country roads out there, and it's not very friendly for bikes. And when you start to add more traffic to that, it becomes more of a problem. Uh, it becomes a safety issue. So, um, so I hope you will take that in consideration. I do want to thank you for having the open houses. Um, I've publicized those quite a bit. Uh, we've, uh, you know, tried to make sure that the people in our district know that those are coming in. I think, I can predict, I think that they will be pretty well attended. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll get a lot of good feedback. Uh, I do want to stress again what uh, Chair Corman said, which is I think it is important to also have a public transit aspect to this project. Uh, we have no public transit really to speak of in our district. Uh, our only public, we don't, we don't even have many WMATA buses. We have a few, but, mm -hmm. uh, but most, it's, it's just ride on and we don't really have any kind of mass transit at all. We don't have any. Um, Shady Grove Metro is it and that's pretty far outside of our district. So uh, so we would appreciate having some access to commuter public transit uh, in our district. Um, we do um, the uh, Mark train, the Germantown station is, um, I think, I believe it's the, the busiest station on the Mark line. So improving the Mark and uh, the other things that were said about uh, making the Mark more accessible to people and, and, uh, and uh, uh, making it run more often uh, would be very helpful to the to the residents of our district. I did want to ask a couple of questions about I-270 and the um, the um, uh, the ICM project that's in place on I-270 with the uh, lights on the ramps and so forth. I did notice in the report that uh, the completion of that project is put as has been pushed back. Um, and in fact, it looks like there's no money budgeted for that project in, in the current year. And I'm just wondering why that's the case. Maybe you can tell me, that's one of my questions. And then the other question I have is, um, are, there, are there any measurements being made about how effective that system is? Do we, do we know if it's making a difference um, on, the, uh, on the traffic flow on I-270? Uh, because if it is, it, you know, it's a pretty good interim solution. If it isn't, then, you know, let's move on. <laughs> so let me tackle first the why were the, the funds shifted back. We've had some challenges around Shady Grove with one of the, the improvements that is, we're working with the county to come up with a solution to be able to move that forward. There's been a lot of back and forth on that. And so um, working through that resolution is taking time, frankly, and, and it didn't make sense to keep cash flows where we knew we weren't going to spend them. Is that the only place where it isn't completed? Is That's this... my understanding. Okay, there, okay, you know, okay. Wanna... So the, uh, the infrastructure, the signals for the northbound um, ramps, they're, they're there, but they're not activated because, right. again, it's contingent upon that um, Shady Grove okay. location. So as far as the um, whether it's working or not, it is working. We have seen time savings. Um, it, you know the specifics; it varies, uh, time of day and and you know incidents and other things. But yes, we have seen a reduction in uh, some of that information. I talked about the award that we won. We did submit some of that and and the time savings and whatnot that we've observed from the system. So it has been effective. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here and. And, uh, and presenting uh, this to us and for your interest in Montgomery County. Uh, and if I may, just on the White's Ferry, I have uh, personally engaged with that. I continue to do that with my counterpart in Virginia. I think, uh, I think we do take a new look at it with what it transpired yesterday. Um, Lieutenant Governor and I, uh, Lieutenant Governor and I are also focused on it. Chris and I have worked on this issue as well. So um, we will continue to push you know, as hard as we can, as many buttons as we can as well, so I'm very familiar with it, very, I understand the, the importance of that project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, at this point, the District 17 
delegation is up. It is my understanding that the House members are going to be speaking first. And why don't you begin in whatever order suits you? Thank you, Chair Kramer. Uh, hello from the side of the table. <laughs> well, uh, before I begin, I think I can safely say on behalf of all four of us, we just want to first of all uplift the comments from our municipal leaders in Rockville and Gaithersburg and the comments they shared about 270 and Clapper Road and Bus Rapid Transit and all of their other asks. Uh, so switching over to speaking for me, um, first of all, a big thank you in terms of this administration and, and MDOT's uh, prioritization and commitment to roadway safety. have very much appreciated the partnership and the conversations and just how much that safety philosophy is reflected in the draft CTP, so thank you for that. Um, I do want to flag that actually here in Montgomery County, the county government has very recently uh, enacted a law on roadway safety in regards to the most urban areas of our county uh, to prohibit right turn on red and also to implement leading pedestrian intervals in a number of places throughout the county. I hope this is something that we can work with you all on to have similar treatment on the state roadways in those same areas, and I'll certainly be following up uh, in regards to that. Um, I do want to address briefly about the I-270 project, and I'll say Delegate Corman did a very thorough job of raising a number of issues, but I'll just share that in District 17 we do continue to hear a lot of uh, concerns from residents, especially about the proposed toll lanes. Um, it is great to see that under this administration there is uh, you know, more focus on, on transit, on pedestrian and, and bicyclist safety, uh, and just a more comprehensive and holistic view of the project, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, but as Delegate Corman mentioned, I think the trust, the public trust really has been eroded and appreciate your commitment to that tonight. Um, the question I wanted to ask is in regards to the upcoming community meetings, uh, and a big thank you for those, can you just speak to how the public comments are going to be used that come out of that? I, I feel like part of the, the issues in the past have been Thousands of comments were submitted, and I think people felt like they fell on deaf ears. Uh, sure. So, so happy to speak to that. Has been working with uh, Administrator Pines and the team uh, on the meeting. Uh, we really see this as a start of resetting the process and talking about a holistic program. Uh, we intend to take in comments on a wide range of what this program looks like transit, transit-oriented development, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, also questions about how this program is delivered. Uh, we'll take that information in, use it to inform our next steps, uh, and then we expect to come back to the public, talk about what we heard, talk about how that helps us better define the program, heard the good comments from the chairman around specificity, around what is the transit program, something we want to uh, better define for sure. So we'll try to take that in, identify what priorities seem to be in the community, and talk about what choices can be uh, for the future uh, at a later date once we've gotten this good information in the weeks ahead. Anything else from Administrator Pines? Sure, I'll just add that um, we, when we put out the press release describing the open houses, within that was a new project website. And so right on that site, it provides the opportunity to submit comments electronically. We will keep a record of all of those and provide summaries through the process on what kinds of comments we're receiving. Regardless of the type and nature, what, what folks are saying, we want to make sure we hear everybody. We make it clear that we understand those comments and that they're carried forward in our thought process. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and to your entire team for joining us here today uh, and for a very insightful conversation. Uh, I want to really focus in on, I know we've mentioned uh, Mark already uh, tonight, just want to focus in on that issue. I know my colleague, uh, Delegate Foley, mentioned the Germantown station. I just want to uh, emphasize that the Gaithersburg and Rockville stations are not far behind when it comes to ridership levels. Uh, I, I've read through uh, the Brunswick Line expansion study, the Brunswick Line running both through Ro Rockville and Gaithersburg, uh, and I see here that one of the, the top priorities for you all right now is monitoring uh, ridership levels, so curious if you can share with us uh, what some of those updated uh, levels are for this year. Sure. Uh, so our mark ridership continues to uh, slowly but steadily grow. We're seeing, you know, a slight month on the, month over month growth. Uh, overall, on mark, it's about uh, 40 for 40 percent of what it was pre-pandemic. Um, the Bruns, the pen line has recovered the, the fastest. We do have the most service there, which I think helps with that. And the weekend service, in particular, is driving a lot of uh, ridership. The Brunswick line um, is a little bit farther behind. Uh, a lot of the um, Brunswick line riders are federal workforce uh, that has not fully returned to, to work yet, and so we're closely monitoring that. And as you know, folks start to come back more, you know, the service is there, and we're ready for that. 
Great. Thank you, Administrator. And, you know, some m many of the spots on the Brunswick line are attractive uh, places to come visit, especially on the weekends. And I know that the weekend service expansion has been uh, uh, when you evaluate what the potential ridership impacts are, uh, that is one that would see significant heightened uh, ridership. So curious as to where we are in the process in terms of uh, expanding to weekend service for the Brunswick line. Yes, yeah, so that is a huge desire uh, that we've heard um, from a lot of folks uh, across the state, honestly. And uh, it's something you know we're interested in. The biggest issue with the, the Brunswick line that I think I say this every year is unfortunately we don't own the tracks. CSX owns the tracks. Uh, and we're limited in what we can do based on kind of what they allow us to do. Uh, so we have been negotiating with them for additional service. We're going to continue to, to push for more service on the Brunswick line, including weekend service. Um, but part of that is the next steps from the, the technical study. So there's some modeling that we need to do. There's some design that we're looking at along the, the corridor. And so we're going to continue those efforts. And it really is kind of convincing CSX that like additional passenger trains are not going to be the end of the world. And, and that's really what we're working towards. And, and just so you're aware, um, I'm taking a little bit more of a holistic approach in our dealings with CSX. We deal a lot with them at the Port of Baltimore, for instance, Tower Street Tunnel, uh, other issues. Uh, so I think that uh, I think that's the way we should look at it and not just one-off issues. So that's been part of the part of the conversation, just so you understand. It's a little bit, a little bit, uh, I think we use some different leverage points, hopefully to get to some other services. Camden Line is another example of that. CSX, if you're listening, we want weekend service on the Brunswick line. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, uh, welcome back to District 17. Thank you all very much for all you do and for the investments uh, in particular in Gaithersburg and Rockville here in District 17 that you all have made and continue to make. Um, I want to just briefly shout out and, and again thank you all for some of the investments uh, that were mentioned earlier this evening, including uh, funding from the Kim Lampier uh, Bike uh, Fund to the City of Rockville on the order of $800,000 or so. Uh, a number of us uh, knew and were friends with Kim and worked with her, and we think it's a great way to um, honor her memory um, as a bicycle uh, activist. Uh, also, the NIST path uh, in Gaithersburg is a critical project, so thank you for your support of that. As you all well know, the National Institute's of standards and technology is sort of what we call the donut hole in the middle of Gaithersburg, which creates challenges and connectivity in a large city. And that's why the NIST path is really a great example of a partnership really between federal and state and local government in order to uh, make that project work together uh, with NIST and the city of Gaithersburg. So thank you for the investment in that. Um, I did also want to briefly uh, thank you as well for uh, funding that I saw programmed uh, for fiscal year 2025 for other projects in our district, which includes uh, the North Stone Street Avenue sidewalk improvements. North Stone Street Avenue is actually a critical corridor that connects uh, a residential neighborhood in East Gaithersburg to the Rockville Metro Station. We talk about transit connectivity. That's a really important project. And I'm sorry? East Rockville. What did I say? East Gaithersburg, sorry. <laughs> Old habits die hard. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, and uh, the Twin Brook project in Rockville, uh, which um, invests uh, funds for a study in fiscal year 2025 for safe routes to school and transit access. So uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for those investments. But um, <laughs> it's a good segue, Senator. Uh, in my former life, I was a municipal official in Gaithersburg. Um, and actually, uh, I think it was Chairman Corman who had to grab my arm earlier uh, when the delegation chairs uh, said it's time for municipal officials to come up and speak. And he was like, not, not you yet, not you yet. Um, but um, I would be remiss as a former municipal official for 16 years and as a former president of the Maryland Municipal League if I didn't bring up the issue of highway user revenues, which I know some of my colleagues have already raised this evening. But I want to echo what's already been said, emphasizing the importance of these funds uh, both to county and municipal government. And uh, as you all know, as we all know, uh, after legislation in 2018 and 2022 increased funding, uh, there's, of course, a statutory formula governing the funding uh, for HUR. Um, so obviously that is already in place. Uh, but what I, my concern is in the out years, particularly as we talk about the lack of balance in the CTP, uh, making sure that the resources will exist to continue to fund HURs under the formula established by statute and making sure that there's uh, sufficient uh, funding in the GMVRA 
uh, and that uh, whatever projections we're using for corporate income tax revenue and the percentage of the corporate income tax revenue collected, which is uh, supposed to go to the Transportation Trust Fund, is going to be sufficient uh, to make sure that we make our commitments under the statutory formula. So I just want to raise that as a priority and a concern. Um, and then finally, I want to echo what's already been said by other representatives about transit access, including uh, expansion of MARC, uh, 355 BRT, and other options. Um, and that's particularly uh, concerning the city of Gaithersburg, even though uh, the city of Rockville also has its needs. But uh, as uh, City Council Member Harris said earlier, uh, Gaithersburg is challenged by the fact that it does not have as many transit options uh, within and immediately abutting uh, the city of Gaithersburg, which makes it a, an even bigger challenge for them to access uh, transit options. So I want to continue to encourage you all to invest in those options to serve uh, Rockville and Gaithersburg. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I am so proud to be serving with these three talented delegates. And uh, I often describe our district as up the red line on Metro or up 270 or up 355, up the Mark uh, line. Uh, District 17, Gaithersburg and Rockville is the, is the center of the county. And we have so many issues that affect all of you. So like everyone, I'm just very grateful. I always look forward to this. And it's not a one-off. We have the opportunity to ask questions in public tonight, but a lot of us are in touch with many of you throughout the year. So I'm just going to make a couple of comments. Oh, a friend of mine's calling. I will call her back. Uh, so I'm starting with Metro uh, because I know that's one of our biggest challenges. And as we hopefully continue to get federal employees going back to work and others going back to their offices downtown, hopefully we'll be able to address some of the economic, the fiscal shortfall. But I just want to give uh, give feedback that the $2 uh, fees get me on the train more often. The free parking on weekends, awesome. Um, and that's exciting. The new signs are fantastic. I love them. They're so much easier to read. Uh, I think we can do better with communication when there's construction and when there are stations that are shut down. It took a long time to cycle through uh, before I got the information I needed while I was standing on the platform. Uh, trash is a problem, and I know that that means hiring more people. But I, um, I sent Charlie Scott a pretty bad photo the other day on the train. And I just, he's not here tonight, but I just want to say our constituent and uh, WMATA's spokes, you know, liaison, Charlie Scott, is wonderful. He's practically on speed dial. I kind of call or text him all the time. And uh, so I just want to do that. Uh, shifting to the airport, uh, Ricky Smith has been uh, accessible and uh, uh, I have called him basically every time I'm taking either a flight out of or into BWI or am in another airport saying, ooh, this is cool, or this sucks, ours is way better. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I would love it if publicly you could talk about signage, and then you and I have also talked about vaping and cannabis and clarification as to what's allowed and not allowed and enforcement of that. Moving on. To the MBA, Chrissy Neiser, uh, also practically on speed dial on so many different issues. Uh, tinted license plate covers, which uh, was my very first bill I enacted in 1995 as a freshman delegate, uh, are coming back. And when we're talking about uh, speed cameras and red light cameras, we have to be able to capture a license plate number. And Administrator Neiser and I have talked multiple times about whether it's due to age or um, purposeful defacement of our license plates so as to evade speed cameras or red light cameras. And I just, um, Ms. Neiser, if you wouldn't mind speaking to the new program that you're, uh, that you're launching, and because I think that's really smart, and I'm eager to see how that goes, a pilot program. So if you would speak to that, again, so my colleagues know about it, and anyone watching can know about it. And then uh, the last thing, um, on this one-year anniversary of uh, Governor Moore and Lieutenant Governor Miller's uh, election, uh, I do want to just reinforce what others have said about 270. And Delegate Foley said very 
well, I think, how we have a little bit of a disconnect in our district, and it's it's hard. Um, Gaithersburg sits in traffic longer uh, because they have further to go down 270 or up 270 on the way home if that's the way they commute. Uh, Rockville is focused on some of the economic uh, and environmental aspects. Um, the the process and the details that the Hogan plan uh, featured were appalling. And I think some of you may know that I testified. I showed up a lot. I submitted written testimony. I came to the Board of Public Works. I came to the hearings uh, to express concerns. And I'm not sure that we still have data on commuting patterns and trends in a post-COVID, if we can gently say that, in a post-COVID world, I don't think we know what commuting patterns look like. And so the whole idea of establishing the old plan, the, the PPP and the expensive tolls and the just all of the lack of collaboration, lack of transparency that was so troubling to many of us, uh, I, and the lack of mass transit really good mass transit options, not just to buy a couple of votes with our county council colleagues and all that. So I commend you. I'm really glad that this is starting fresh and thoughtfully and transparently, and we look forward to figuring these out. It's not easy. And, uh, and I just want to give a shout out to all of our constituents who have been very thoughtfully and diligently engaged in the conversation, including we're, we gave a shout out to Mayor Newton, who's re, who's retiring. Uh, Rockville City Council Member Mark Pershala, uh was really the earliest first leader in uh, speaking out and expressing concerns and organizing residents of Rockville with his concerns. So I want to give him a shout out as well. Um, with that, I'd ha be happy to take uh, take your answers to some of the issues yes. that I've raised. Uh, yes. Good evening, Senator. You know, often when you call, um, <laughs> you find stuff in the airport, and I often say to myself, there's no way in the world that's wrong, right? And you find stuff that I walk the airport all day, every day, and you're right. able to find stuff um, that I don't see. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your vigilance and, I mean, your insight. So with respect to signage, I mean, inside the terminal, we're always updating our signage. Yes. The airport is a dynamic place, as you can imagine, and it's constant under construction, and that's, that drives the wayfinding and the signage. And so um, we're constantly doing some one-offs, but we are engaged in a master signage program for both the airport, the wayfinding program for both the terminal and the roadway. The roadway is going to be tied more to a longer-term master planning process, um, and we work very closely with the State Highway Administration. I know you've raised some concerns about signage on the major thoroughfares to the airport. We've had yeah. conversations with, um, I've had conversations with Administrator Pines and other members of his team, and I know they've done a, some amazing work clearing some of the signage um, so that it's more visible. He can speak to that more than I can, but um, signage is something that um, that's very dynamic, and, and we're looking at making some improvements down the road. Great. And Mr. Smith, if you wouldn't mind just speaking also to the vaping and cannabis, because that was unclear last time you and I talked as to the new law, the legalization of yes. recreational cannabis, what's allowed in the airport and what's not. That wasn't clear. And vaping, which I observed in the terminal. Yes. Um, and so we've, um, we've made changes to the digital signs to update um, those signs, because that's something we could do more, immedi uh, more immediately. I mean, there are thousands of signs around the airport that refer to smoking, and so we're changing those in a phased approach, but we are making the, up, the um, updates to include vaping as well and, and e-cigarettes. So to be clear, vaping yeah. is not permitted within the airport, that is within correct. the terminals. That is okay. correct. Just yes. to anyone's watching and stuff, I just want to be really clear about no, that. that is that's correct. Is that's helpful smoking. information. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it's good to see you. So as we've talked about, you know, there's two flavors of this. One is somebody deliberately defacing their plate traditionally for evasion, whether it's from law enforcement or tolls or, or other speed cameras. Um, and then there's just plate wear and tear. And so um, it's more difficult for us and for law enforcement. We've talked about the current construct of the law, which talks about intent. And for an officer pulling somebody over, it's really difficult to determine that they intentionally went and, and destroyed the plate at times. Some of them are very creative, and you probably can figure it out. 
Um, but on the other hand, we want to look at some of these older plates, recognizing it's not only important for our law enforcement partners, but now with cameras being just much more prevalent, we want to make sure there's accuracy there. So we're looking at a program um, that will give customers more accessible options if they want to replace these really older plates, um, or today it just might not be top of mind. So it would be a process along with their renewal where they would get an option to be able to get that newer plate, which obviously would be much more readable. So we'll certainly keep you all updated as we start to implement the program and wanting to make sure obviously residents understand what that means. They will get a new number and so if you're, you know, tied to your number, that's that's something you want to know. And it will be an option for customers, not something that's mandatory. And not custom plates, only if you have a regular right, plate. Right, just talking about standard yeah. issue plates. Thank you. There's one other thing that I neglected, if I could, just I need to say it out loud again this year. Cell service is appalling on the eastern half of the ICC. And I know you guys don't build cell towers, but I have talked to cell phone companies, dropped calls when you're talking to your congressman or something uh, are a problem. And uh, it is really consistent after, right after Georgia, all the way to 95. It's a problem. Or to 3297 on the way to Annapolis, it's, it is consistent and they are, it is unreliable and I think it's many different carriers. So to the degree that you guys have a magic wand or an ability to partner with someone, there are a lot of us who would be very grateful who do use the ICC and I literally on occasion have opted to do the terrible thing of down 270, around 495, up 95, literally just to make sure that I could continue to return phone calls or be on a Zoom or whatever. So please, if there's anything for that. And with that, Mr. Secretary and all of you, we appreciate you and uh, it's nice to see you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, District 17. Chair Polakovich Carr, who's coming up? All righty, District 20 in the house. I see State Delegate Lorig Charkudian. All right. Good evening. It's good to see everyone. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary and team. Um, I do need to say, I um, apologize I missed some of your presentation. I actually, uh, my plane landed at 630. Um, it was 15 minutes late, though, so I won't hold you accountable for that. I'm going to blame, I'll blame the Boston airport. Um, but I am glad I made it. It is a top priority of mine to participate in this conversation. I think it's, um, I'm really grateful. Uh, it must be very tedious for you to do this all around the state, so I appreciate what that takes um, in terms of your time uh, every night for many nights. Um, but I think it's a really important conversation, so I, I thank you for that opportunity. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself as well as Senator Smith and Delegate Moon and Delegate Wilkins. Um, and I wanted to start with a couple of contextual um, pieces, and then I want to talk about a couple of specific projects that are outlined in the CTP and some of our, our feedback on it. So first, in terms of context, I appreciate that the big um, conversation in front of you right now is about revenue, and I have full trust in my colleague, uh, Chair Corman, and, and those conversations that you're having. And I know they're going to be hard conversations, um, and I appreciate that we're having those conversations because we do need to have those conversations from the context of what is it that we need to do to have safe and reliable transportation, to prioritize transit, to prioritize communities that have historically been disadvantaged and left behind, to make pedestrian safety and bike safety a reality in all communities, and that does take revenue. And so we have to have those hard conversations, and I appreciate that you're having them. I also think it's important to have them in the context of the fact that you're inheriting um, eight years, which um, a lot of which was not responsibly handled in terms of revenue. Um, and so by that, I mean um, problematic decisions about tolls. I mean deferred maintenance. And I think um, you may or may not be able to say that publicly, but I'd like to take this opportunity to say that because I think that you're in a position that is unfortunately worse than it would have to be if we had had um, you know, a different sort of history in terms of the um, revenue um, uh, up until now. And so you end up with that sort of backlog as well as the challenges of the economy in general and the drying up of, of federal COVID money and so on. So I appreciate that difficult conversation and I'm ready to support whatever efforts come out of that. 
Um, the second thing that I want to say as it relates to that and the history, not just of the last eight years, but the history of the last, I don't know, maybe 50 years of a car-centric um, transportation systems, is that you know we have uh, recognizing that the transit needs and the pedestrian safety, uh, pedestrian and bike needs are, um, you know, have been recognized. I appreciate that they are now a priority for you. I appreciate that every single one of my colleagues talked about them. Um, and I just think that it's, um, again, recognizing the history of it's not just that we have to do that alongside transportation, but it's the makeup time that we have to do. It's the makeup of the history of not investing in those and prioritizing car movement. And frankly, um, I've talked a lot about not playing sort of whack-a-mole with, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time going, and I am going to spare you the actual spreadsheet, which um, Administrator Pines does have access to, which has 97 things on it. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole spreadsheet tonight, but I, but there is a, 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 a reality, I think, and I would encourage encourage State Highway and MDOT to look at of, you know, still a lot of the rules that get used to consider even crosswalks and pedestrian safety issues is what are their impact on moving cars. And the term that's used is mobility, but what's meant by it is cars. And so I think that's a really important thing as it relates to just the, the systems change that are needed so we're not perpetually playing whack-a-mole. I've had legislation to try to get at some of those systems change. I'll continue to bring legislation, hopefully working with you on that. But there are some real structural systems change and just in terms of how we think about and what rules are used to determine can we put a crosswalk here or not. Um, and so, so that's, um, and you know, then within that context, while we're talking about history, of course, there's communities that have been underinvested in, low income communities, communities of color tend to be the ones where we have the most pedestrian accidents because there hasn't been the sufficient um, commitment to those communities over, again, decades of, of redlining and, and so on. So, um, so that's sort of big picture things that I would ask you to be thinking about, and if you, you want to comment on them, I'm, I'm happy to hear about that today or, or uh, at another time. Um, I won't repeat everything that was said about the American Legion Bridge 270 and 495, except to, to share um, highlight that you know our team also wants to make sure that transit is prioritized we're concerned that a lot of the project looks similar to uh the previous administration's project and that the transit components while they're highlighted more are still very vague and so it's hard to have faith in for all the reasons that have been discussed that transit um, is going to be a real part of that and how it's going to be funded, how it's going to be um, really t taking cars off the road. Um, sharing also what's also already been said about minimizing late lane, um, sorry, uh, additional um, asphalt. So working within the, the current, um, the current uh, footprint. And then um, just to uh, I know that there's been a couple of conversations about and federal federal funds that have been applied for. Um, I, I think that a P3 may still be on the table. I would strongly urge you to take it off the table as quickly as possible. I think the absolute disaster of the Purple Line P3 should make MDOT never consider a P3 again. Um, it's just um, we can't have private companies are never going to take on risk and I think what we saw with the purple line is they don't actually take on risk when the risk comes to them they sue the state and they walk away and so we should never be doing p3s for public transportation projects period um, and I hope that you don't do one um, uh, that that's not being considered on the on the um, lanes moving on to the purple line uh, thank you uh, for uh, administrator Holly for all that you have done to keep that on track despite the fact that a mistake was made and deciding to go forward with that as a p3 um, so I do appreciate that I do want to highlight that uh, because um, it, I am a, uh, been a huge supporter of the purple line from the beginning it's crucial we need it for all the reasons that have been talked about but we also need to recognize that the communities that the purple line goes through are paying the sacrifices for a benefit to the entire region. And because it's been delayed so long, they continue to pay those sacrifices. And those sacrifices are both in terms of business impact. They're also in terms of pedestrian safety and, and minimizing pedestrian access to um, to uh, schools and businesses and so on. Um, and it has been really disheartening how hard it has been to make basic pedestrian safety um, repairs, uh, um, 
uh, just as part of, apparently most of the pedestrian safety is not part of the standard contract, and so pretty consistently when there's a pedestrian safety issue, it ends up with me making a phone call to you after going through the 17 other steps that one would take, and most of those are things that you would think that a contractor would actually, you know, fix a sidewalk after they're done tearing it up. Um, it turns out it's not in the contract to do most of that. Um, issues of, you know, two sides of sidewalks being blocked at the same time, it's happening less and less, but it still happens. Um, it's kind of, it's, I, I appreciate that what I hear from MDOT across the board is pedestrian safety is our top priority. It doesn't show up enough in general, and it certainly doesn't show up in the purple line construction areas. It just doesn't, and I can't, it's shocking to me how much time my staff and I spend trying to get really basic things like the sign that got left on the sidewalk that's blocking um, people from being able to walk down the sidewalk or a, um, a sidewalk that is flush with the, uh, with the street where children are walking to school by themselves, a 10-year-old, a 5-year-old, and I'm watching the 5-year-old lay down and throw a tantrum on the sidewalk that is flush with the street with a you know bus coming down the street. It's like... You know, like you just have to ask, like, would you all let your kids walk to school there? Um, so, uh, you know, I think you know uh, we've been in touch with a lot of those, but I just, it would be great to see it dealt with more proactively. I want to move on to uh, Montgomery Hills. Um, this is a project that's been in the making for a long time. Um, we are disappointed in the delay. It's not clear what that, that year long delay uh, is about. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. Um, I think uh, the other issue with Montgomery Hills, uh, and I'm, I'm working on getting to how we got to this place, I know we have some follow-up conversations coming up, but there is the issue of the left turn um, at Seminary Place, and um, I've spent a lot of time reviewing all the documents that the community has had access to and that we've all been looking at for the last five years, um, and I think I have pinpointed why there's a miscommunication, why, that, why um, I think uh, none of us could clearly see on any of those that the intention of the department was to limit that left turn and essentially drive traffic through a community, through a community where there's no sidewalks, um, by the way, so it's just driving that traffic there. I think I understand how that happened, um, and I'm happy to share those details with you sometime other than now, but I think my request would be, given that I think um, it is a legitimate misunderstanding, that you would work as quickly as possible to fix it in a way that makes it accessible to the community that really has engaged in good faith for 30 years with the Department of Transportation to try to get this project moving. I uh, want to talk about Stewart Lane and Route 29. Um, earlier this year, um, Tech Lubush and Siba was killed at that um, intersection. Um, I want to uh, highlight that I have looked at and I believe the project is uh, going out to bid, and I think you just said that. Um, it's really crucial. It's a very dangerous intersection. It's an intersection that up until very recently, it took 20 minutes to cross safely. We now have a crosswalk there, but there's other things that need to be added um, to make it 20 minutes because you would have had to go like a mile down the road and come back around. Um, so. Um, the community um, who lost a dear friend and a father and, and, and husband um, has been very active and um, and I just, you know, the, the plans I think have been on the books for a while and so I just really hope that we can prioritize making that happen. And the last area that I want to talk about where we also have lost several precious community members is uh, Hillendale area which is Route 650. Um, near where it crosses the Beltway, and I think that I think it's part of the PSAP process. Um, I uh, am really grateful to see the PSAP process. I think it's a really important step in the right direction. There's so many more places beyond the ones that are even identified in it that need to be addressed, but I think that's a really important step. I believe that this area is within that mix, and so I just want to say we've lost, um, since I've been elected, at least three or four people, and I've heard about um, others who have been killed not that long before that in that area. So. Um, it's a it's very much a place where design um, could make a massive difference and so I really hope that all of these areas get uh, designed and fixed before we lose any more constituents um, that is what I have I didn't know if, if anyone had any any comments on any of those or qu additional questions so on the uh, going I try to tackle all of them <laughs> so Almost would have been. It's getting late. I'm getting tired. Um, ALB 270 
So um, one of the steps that we're taking in the outreach process with the open houses is that we want to hear some of that community feedback on the different transit options. So the displays and the, and the content that will be provided there does, a, does sort of lay out some of the options that are being considered in a high conceptual level so that we can get some of that input before really starting to run further with, with advancing concepts. So I know you, your comment was, was well taken that the advancement of those concepts isn't that far yet, but we want to make sure that the options that are being considered are, are kind of flushed out further through the public outreach process. So that's part of the open house schedule. Come to those, you'll get to see more there and, and we'll, we'll have there. some opportunities. Um, Montgomery Hills, happy to engage with the community looking forward to our meeting tomorrow to kind of go back over the history um, happy to share you know we, we there were there was a rather extensive public process on that already um, we do have a record of decision with the turn lanes as they are so that makes it kind of challenging just to revisit all of that frankly but happy to um, discuss that further having a, a meeting with miss foster and walking through the uh, concerns that she laid out in her letter so looking forward to discussing that tomorrow. Thanks. Did you want to? Yes, yeah, so I'll just note on Purple Line, um, definitely, I mean, you and I have had lots of conversations and we hear you loud and clear the concerns um, about pedestrians and it's something that we are focused on. You know, Ray, I'm gonna give him a lot of credit. He's out and about on the corridor a lot more than he has been. He's given direction to his team and you, you know what you've seen differences. We're not there yet. We need to continue to push. Uh, we're continuing to push the contractor as well, that like they own the site, they need to take uh, ownership of it and, and make sure that they're um, making it, providing that access for pedestrians. So we're gonna continue to work. Uh, we're gonna continue to you know get this project across the finish line and we're gonna make sure we're prioritizing pedestrians as, as we do that. Um, and we appreciate again that you're you know continued pushing on, on that as well. And if you see anything, uh, we also, I'm not sure if you're able to make it to the tour tomorrow, but look forward to you know sharing more on kind of progress and where we are on that tomorrow. Yeah, my staff will be there. Thank Great. you. Thanks a lot. Next up, District 18. I see Delegate Solomon is here. Here we go. Um, thank you. It's good to see you all. Um, and I have to start off by saying, obviously, um, we're saddened why we're back here tonight um, and appreciate you all being with uh, the Appropriations Committee on, on Friday. I know we had a long hearing and I'm sure the hundreds of people watching right now also watched the Appropriations hearing on Friday. Um, so I'm going to try to stick more towards the local issues and I appreciate you answering a lot of our questions for, for a good bit of time. Um, I wanted to start off by just saying thank you, especially to the D3 um, SHA team. Um, Derek, I know you're here. Joe is probably somewhere, I'm sure, watching. Uh, oh, hey, there you are. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we miss you in District 3, but we're glad that you're going on to bigger and better things. Uh, but the team has just been incredible to work with. Um, I think actually we have our quarterly meeting coming up next week, um, although I feel like Eden or another member of our team talks to you on a, or a member of your staff on a regular basis. Um, and I think a lot of the improvements that we've seen in our community really reflect the incredible level of responsive, responsiveness. So thank you on that. Um, Administrator Smith, thank you for hosting us at, uh, at the airport and congratulations on the bathroom award. They were pretty nifty. Um, check them out if, you, uh, if you're in BWI. Um, and then obviously congratulations on the incredible announcement on the um, Northeast Corridor. Um, what, seven or $8 billion um, coming to the state of Maryland. I was actually at an event earlier tonight, a community association meeting and people didn't know it and they were very excited because they wanted to know in true Montgomery County fashion, somebody asked, why aren't we getting more money from the infrastructure bill? Um, and I was able to say, well, you ask and, and shall receive. Um, so I wanted to, to just highlight again some, uh, some of the more local issues, um, and I'm gonna stick it to sort of um, the, the modality, um, and I'll start with, with State Highway Administration and Administrator Pines. Um, thank you for, for talking earlier this afternoon, and I won't reiterate the, the piece on Montgomery Hills. Um, Delegate Charcutian and the District 20 team, We've our, our districts have worked hand in glove. That's the, the middle point of our district. So happy to continue that conversation and appreciate your commitment to that. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of local, like hyper local issues. Um, the um, traffic lights that we're working on for Georgia Avenue in Wheaton. Um, I know you all have worked hand in glove with MDOT on that. We have some utility issues and I know we're working with your team on some potential utility legislation, but just 
can't stress enough that we want to get that light actually in there. And I know we're getting close on some of the um, right of way issues and the redesign. Um, and then I do have to say, again, I was at a community association meeting in East Bethesda, and I announced to folks that we had made that uh, decision on the new traffic light at 410 and Edgevale and Maple, and literally the entire room cheered. Um, so super excited, and again, Administrator Pines, thank you for, for giving me the update on the schedule. Um, people are very excited to hear that, um, and I know that's something that's literally taken four years um, between the community and the town of Chevy Chase. Um, the signals at Andrews and Veers Mill also were something I know we're sucked into the utility nether, nether world, so we just want to highlight that's something that we really need there. I can't thank you all enough, the Connected Communities Grant for Wheaton. We are incredibly excited about Drew. Thank you for, for helping to spearhead that um, on your side of things. But, um, you know, we're grateful, Mr. Secretary, that you came with the governor earlier this year to walk Wheaton with us, um, not just the downtown corridor, but, you know, we worked with your team on the Veers Mill improvements as well. But that is just, um, that's an area that we can't, we can't get those improvements in there quickly enough. So appreciate your partnership on that. Um, I won't reiterate the 270 piece uh, and 495. Um, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to hear the chair's comments, but um, I, I've been in enough events with him that I, I know exactly what he said. Um, and I think you heard you heard my questions on Friday. The, the one question that I did just want to ask, because I really want to hear you say it publicly, because I know it's important, very important to my constituents and to a whole host of the county. No matter what happens, the eastern portion of 495 after the 270 spur is completely and totally off the table. Correct. <laughs> For the record, the secretary is nodding his head. So excellent. Uh, I know we still have a long way to go on the other portions and appreciate what hopefully will be a complete reset starting next week. Um, and, uh, and again, if you're watching, come to Bethesda Chevy Chase High School on Monday night, 630 to 830. Um, just going through the, the only other local issue, and uh, I know there was something in the CTP for it, and be curious if you could add a little bit more detail. And, and again, Derek, I know we're going to talk more about this, the sidewalks on 192 and Capitol View. Um, there's money in the CTP for it. Where are we with that? It's, a, it's been a huge priority and an ongoing, long-standing issue. So we, we can talk about that next week, but I did just want to want to put that on the radar. And then I know there's an ongoing conversation, again, with the town of Chevy Chase on widening um, the intersection of Bradley and Wisconsin. Um, and appreciate that your team is really working constructively on that to try to eliminate some of the, the backlog issues at, at that intersection. Um, moving on to, to MTA. Administrator Arnold, you know, on Brunswick, uh, and I'm glad to hear all my colleagues talking about it too. Um, you know, the, I had a conversation with your team on some of the Kensington specific issues and excited to work on some of the, the station improvements that, that they're interested in looking at, the rail crossing, and obviously we're continuing to push and rally the, rally the troops around enhanced Brunswick line service. Um, so anything we can do and partner on that. Um, I know uh, Chair Corman made sure that I wanted to, I, I got to speak on this. Broken record, I say it every time we're together, Capitol Crescent Trail, as soon as we can open it, honoring the commitment from the original uh, the original folks uh, who ran the, the Purple Line Partners um, and appreciate that we're having that event and walk through tomorrow. Um, and then I will reiterate, which I'm sure you've heard from other folks, just the importance of funding for Metro. Um, you know, our district has, I believe, eight Metro stations in it. Um, and I, and again, Mr. Secretary, you know this better than anybody, just, they're working, it's so critical to our region. Um, and again, that's part of the, the conversation of revenue that we need. Um, you know, I think we as a state need to understand that it's time for us to eat our vegetables. And again, I know you can't say it, but we didn't have this conversation for the last eight years and we're left holding the bag for decisions from previous elected officials who didn't want to have an adult conversation. Um, and whether it be Metro or funding for other transit across the state or other really important priorities to the continued growth of our, of our region and our state, we have to have that conversation. Um, and then lastly, uh, this one doesn't fall sort of neatly in the CTP, but um, is really important to a lot of businesses in our community and unfortunately is a program that falls in your bailiwick. And again, you got kind of left holding the bag, um, the, tr the uh, tourism area uh, corridor signage program, the TAC program uh, that I know you're shaking your head and Samantha's been a great partner on it and actually the, the comptroller is now wants to be engaged on it. She, we were visiting some, uh, actually a winery in our district and a bunch of other farm breweries. If we can figure out how to just get our businesses the signs 
They will. They are willing to pay for them if you are willing to fabricate them and help us place them. Um, and we spend so much money in the commerce side of things to get these businesses growing and to start them. Um, and if we can just go that extra little bit, uh, little mile to make sure that there's a sign on the road to let our, our wonderful residents know that they exist, I think it'll go a long way. So again, appreciate you being here. I know it's a long night um, and, and thank you again. Thank you, sir. Right. Last but certainly not least, District 39, and Delegate Greg Woods is here. And the good news is we can go home after my presentation. <laughs> so again, thank you, uh, Delegate Greg Wims, 39. I uh, bring greetings from Senator Nancy King, Delegates Leslie Lopez, and Gabe Asseverro. Most of the things that I was going to talk about tonight have already been talked about. But I wanted to emphasize, uh, first of all, let me say, all of us in 39 uh, are praying for the family, of Joy's family, and our sympathies are there. And um, if any of you talk to them, let them know that Thank from you. District 39 and all of us. It was mentioned earlier from our CEO, CAO from Montgomery County about the um, rapid uh, transit line on 355. So you've talked about that, but I wanted to let everyone know that we had a town hall meeting uh, last year, and this was a huge item that came up with some 80 or so people were there. And then just a couple weeks ago, a lot of you were there in uh, Black Rock in my district in Germantown, and we talked about that and other transportation issues. So I just wanted to bring up that that is very important for us, not only in 39, but also uh, Rockville and uh, North. And then Vice President um, Friedson mentioned Clopper Road. I take that road every day. And uh, I've been taking it for work for about the last three or four years, and it's just gotten worse and worse. And we ask that you put that back on for funding. And I'll tell you what's happening over the, over the last three years. Clarksburg has grown, and Clopper Road goes the back way to Clarksburg, and it's still growing. Housing is still being built there. But also now the people in Frederick County use that Clopper Road to come down to work at the Bureau of Standards or whatever in the Gabersburg area. So the capacity has really risen and there have been a lot of accidents, as you know. So I want to emphasize again to think about that again, the funding for Clopper Road. Also I wanted to mention that uh, the Mark Train, everyone has talked about it, but the question I have is, is there any consideration of having the train during the week go instead of the back and forth to twice a day, maybe three times a day, to so give uh, other people work late or different schedules something. So if you could answer that when we finish, we appreciate it. And then the very last thing that I have is, uh, you mentioned that 1,300, uh, I guess, families or individuals got tax credits from the elected vehicles. So something that came up at our last uh, town hall meeting was, in Montgomery County, do you have an idea, or even over the next two years, how many charging stations actually? will be uh, built. And that's something that we want to get a, the answer if you have the answer. If not, you can get back to me later. And uh, with that, that's all the questions that I have for this time. I can start so on the, the mark. Uh, so yes, we are looking at uh, increased service on the, the Brunswick line, uh, including additional midday service. So like providing yes. this, right now we're very much on the, the peak commuter focus of morning and evening and looking at the possibility of more midday service so that you can come in in the morning, do a meeting, then go home at lunchtime, that type of thing. Um, again, I mentioned CSX previously. Uh, we are in negotiations with them. Again, I appreciate the support from the secretary for the additional leverage that we haven't necessarily had previously, and so that's that's good. But um, you know, still looking to do that. I would encourage you and your constituents as well to complete the survey that we have out now okay. to really kind of express preferences for right. Is it is it midday? Is it weeknight? Like what type of um, and times of service that people are looking for? Thank you. And I'll talk a second about electric vehicles yes. and the charging infrastructure. So um, as part of the infrastructure bill, there is what's called the NEVI program or National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. That, um, the part of the first phase of that was to identify the routes that meet or priority <laughs> corridors to install charging stations and they have to have certain distance off the highway. We're currently working on an RFP that will go out to partner with different um, locations that have sites available to install those and the state acts as a conduit to get them the federal dollars for those private parties to install the charging stations at Wawa's and Royal Farms and all over the place you know near these areas so there's not a specific number that we're targeting 
um, part of the uh, requirements from the federal government in this first round is that along those corridors you try to ensure that there's at least one charging station every 50 miles or less and so um, there's already a if you go online there's a gis map that provides all of the existing charging infrastructure uh, and then th th with that nevi program um, we're providing preference to proposers that bring locations that help us meet those build out requirements to fill in the spacing where there aren't chargers today so well, that's coming out soon we plan to advertise that early next year and and start that partnership with those who will install those chargers and after that there's additional rounds of the nevi program after that but the corridors and everything haven't been identified it's really focused on those primarily interstate highways and large u.s highway network um, where the the first round of charging gets installed well, thank you and i'll just say drive safely to back home <laughs> thank you delegate whims my good friend good to see you sir um, folks that concludes our evening I'd like to say thank you very much to all of my uh, colleagues in the legislature who came out this evening, offered their thoughts and comments, which reflect the uh, needs of their constituents. Uh, so I appreciate their being here, our other elected officials. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for you and your team taking the time uh, to hear the expressed concerns um, that uh, I think are all issues that if we can work on it and do the best we can, uh, will make lives much better for the residents of our great state. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. It's very much appreciated. Look forward to working with all of you um, in the future. And, uh, and thank you again. And with that, I'll step out of the way. <laughs> thank you, Senator Kramer. Um, I too will add my thanks. We just very much appreciate your generosity of time. I have a feeling that maybe in Montgomery County, we tend to go along on these maybe longer than other counties, but we appreciate you hearing all of the, the multitude of thoughts from our delegation. I just wanna add a thanks to our delegation administrator and to the uh, county council staff. Uh, who helped with the logistics on our end in terms of making the event happen and did want to put a plug in for the listening public that if anyone has thoughts on transportation or anything else um, that you'd like to bring to the attention of the state delegation, we are having our annual priorities hearing this coming Monday, November 13th at 7 p.m. This is going to be an online Zoom hearing. Uh, but if you'd like to sign up to testify either orally or to submit written testimony, you can do so on our website, montgomerycountydelegation.com. And I think with that, we are